I use the gavel app. Something. No, it's something. It's, it's a All right, we're going to go ahead and uh, um, call the regularly scheduled planning commission for October 7, 2020 to order. If you would, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. Ms. Leiter, do we have any changes to today's agenda? Yes, good morning. Good morning. Changes to the agenda are the following. Swearing in members Mike Rowe and Paul Rodledge, who were reappointed to the Planning Commission by the Board of County Commissioners on October 1st, 2020. Minutes for approval, September 10, 2020, and September 24, 2020, with the recommended motion as follow. I move to approve the, mi the minutes of September 10, 2020, and September 24, 2020. Item number three, PDR 1919P, related to PDR 1414PR2, BK Summer Woods, LLC, Summer Woods, PLM 1910-0011. Revised maps, maps attached. And item number five, PDR 1909PR, Meritage Home of Florida, ENC owner Savannah PLN 2004-006 and um, item number C 6C2006 Savannah Commercial Resort Meritage Home of Florida ENC owner Caston Net Lease Properties LLC contract purchase additional public comment letters including including requests from attorney representing citizens, additional representation time. Attach an and a letter from the applicant requesting both applications be here together and request for additional time for rebuttal. The changes has been to the agenda are reflected in the e-agenda. Very good, thank you. Uh, Ms. Schenk, is there anything from the county attorney's office? No changes. Very good, thank you. All right, we're going to move on to the first item on. Okay. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and call a brief recess. Five minutes enough? All right, we're going to pause for five minutes. So uh, we'll be back. Thank you.
All right, we're going to go ahead and call the meeting back to order. Um, so we were on our uh, first uh, item on the agenda today is the swearing in of Mr. Ron and Mr. Rutledge to their um, to their new term. So if you could please rise to be sworn in. Quintana Acevedo with the clerk's office, and I'm here to administer the oath of office. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will support, protect, and defend the Constitution and government of the United States and of the state of Florida, that you are qualified to hold office under the Constitution of the state, and that you will faithfully perform the duties of the Planning Commission, the office upon which you are about to enter? I do. Congratulations on behalf of the clerk's office. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Do we and accept and speeches or anything? No, 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 no. We're not doing that. Donation. <laughs> <laughs> Just toler tolerating you. <laughs> Don't look at me when you say that. <laughs> All right. Um, the next item on the agenda is the uh, minutes for approval. Uh, and to be clear, we have two. Um, two sets of minutes, the one for the uh, September 10th hearing and the September 24th hearing. So um, if there are any changes, modifications, clarifications, please uh, let us know. Otherwise, we'll entertain a motion. Mr. Chair, Mr. Ron. I'll make a motion to approve the September 10th and September 24th minutes of the Manti County Planning Commission. Very good. Uh, motion, is there a second? Mr. Roth, second. Any discussion? All right, call the matter to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Chair votes aye. Motion passes 6-0 with Mr. Heap being absent. Thank you. All right, the next item on the agenda is um, citizen comments. And this is an opportunity for anybody in the audience who wishes to speak on something that is not on today's agenda. Um, if you wish to speak on an application that's being heard today, you'll have an, you'll have an opportunity when that application is being uh, being um, presented, but is there anybody who wishes to speak on something that is not on today's agenda? Okay, seeing no one come forward, I would like to note that Miss um, uh, Petroff uh, provided written comments uh, for public co the public comment portion of the hearing regarding um, accessory dwelling units. So, um, if you have an opportunity, please review that. Uh, Mr. O'Shea, I did see your name mentioned here. Do you have a uh, a clarification or some information regarding when the next hearing for that accessory dwelling units is uh, going? Is it in the near future? Mr. Chair, the next um, hearing would be on um, November 5th. That would be the first reading to the Board of County Commissioners. And if that goes well, the adoption hearing would be held on December 10th. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, we're going to move on to the um, the uh, first application to be heard on. I'm sorry, it's actually a uh, legislative matter. So um, we're going to go to the first item, number two, which is uh, the Land Development Code text amendment. So um, who's presenting that, Mr. Shea? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to enter. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Leiter, could you please enter that into the record? Yes, item number two, LDCT 2003, Ordinance 2015, County Initiated Land Development Code Text Amendment, Accessory Dwelling Units ADUs, PLN 2002-0090, amending the Land Development Code by amending Chapter 2, Definitions to Provide Definition for Accessory Dwelling Units ADU, amending Chapter 4, Zoning by amended and sexory dwelling unit as a use in a specific zoning district in section 401.2 table 4-1 uses in agriculture and residential district table 4-12 a square of uses for plan development PD districts to amend section 403.a.c Costa overlay district Costa high hazard area, coastal evacuation area, and coastal planning area by adding accessory dwelling units to prohibit uses, activities, and by adding language to section 
2.13 Whitfield Residential Overlay District to prohibit the construction of a second, secondary housing unit. Amending Chapter 5, Part 2, Standard for Accessory Uses and Structures to create a new section 511. Point 18, accessory dwelling units, ADUs, to provide development standards and guidelines for accessory dwelling units to create a new section 511.19, guest houses to provide sunset date and means to convert an existing guest house to an accessory dwelling unit. This is a legislative uh, project, and Mr. Biloche, principal planner, is going to present the case. <coughs> Very good, thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Planning Commissioners. Bill O'Shea presenting for staff. Before we get started, I just wanted to call attention to an item that I entered into the record this morning. It is comments from the school board. Um, although they were written on October 10th, the first time that I saw them was late yesterday afternoon. Um, and before we get into the PowerPoint, I wanted to I'm sorry, October 2nd was the date of the, the memo. Um, before we get into the PowerPoint presentation, I wanted to just give you a little bit of history on where we've been and where we're trying to go today. Um, ADUs is a, an item that the county has tried to adopt an ordinance on going back as far as 10 years ago when a couple planners worked on it. And in more recent years, like from 2017 on, there's been at least three or four planners that have worked on it. There's been several renditions of it. You had heard this item last year, I believe it was in, in um, April and June. It went to the board, I believe, in September, and the board felt like there was more work that needed to be done on the ordinance, so it didn't go forward and get approved at that time. Since that time, staff has been working on revising uh, the ordinance. Um, we held a work session with the Board of County Commissioners on August 4th and got some specific direction from them on how they would like to see the ordinance crafted. So we are here today to present um, our recommendation as, as modified per the board direction um, on August 4th. So for those who may not be familiar with ADUs, what is an ADU as proposed? Um, it's an attached or detached residential unit. It's subordinate and separate from the primary or principal dwelling unit. It has full kitchen and bathroom facilities. It must be held in common ownership with the principal dwelling, and it is not considered in density calculations. These are the types of accessory dwelling units that you could see. There's attached where you could have it attached to an existing residence. There's detached where it can be a separate structure from the residence or there's detached above a garage, or it could be a second story above an existing residence. This picture shows you um, an attached first story ADU. The, image, or the portion of the building that is closest to you is the actual ADU. This would be an attached to an existing residential unit. It's, above, it's located above the garage. Whoops, I'm sorry. And this would be a freestanding um, detached unit that normally would be located somewhere in the rear yard. Also is a detached unit above a detached gar uh, a garage. So before we get into the regulations, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some misconceptions about ADUs. Uh, the first one is that everyone will want one. Uh, construction costs right now are very high. It's going to take a significant investment to build an ADU. So um, people would probably have to have a really good reason to want one, such as they want to move an elderly parent into their 
into their yard or one of their children that might want to kind of leave the nest but not necessarily the residence. Um, it could be for a, a couple or maybe a couple with a small child. But it will be a big investment, and it, if, you, if people want to do it for rental purposes to make income, it may be a long time before they realize any gain on that investment. The second misconception is everyone can have one. Um, setbacks, uh, the location of the existing house on the property, um, natural resources could, could keep one from either getting an ADU or from getting the maximum allowable size ADU. A lot of people think that no impact fees will be assessed, and that is not true. Uh, the lowest um, impact fee category is up to 1,000 square feet, and ADUs will be assessed that fee during the building permit stage. And that you could, and the final misconception is that we will not look at utility capacity, but during the building permit, we will look at water and and uh, sewer availability. And if it is not available, they won't be able to get a permit. So prior work by staff up to now, um, we have researched and spoke with other jurisdictions about their ADU ordinances or regulations. Um, we've solicited input from other county agencies and departments. We've drafted and reviewed the ordinance several times to address both board and public um, comments and concerns. And we continue to work on and refine the ordinances directed by the board. So this is some of the, or most of the outreach that we could think of that has been done to date. And as you can see, we have tried to reach out on several occasions through workshops with the board, um, through meetings with homeowners associations, um, through various groups. Um, after COVID became a reality, we tried to change the way that we were trying to get the information out. So the county does have a publication that goes out monthly. It's called Neighborhood Connections. So we did put out a blast in that on three different occasions providing the draft language and potential hearing dates in the future and how they could comment on them if they so desired. Um, we had put a um, press release on the website with the data, with the uh, proposed language and how they could contact. That has been updated with the most recent language. Um, so we feel like um, we did reach out to everyone um, and tried to the best we could under the current situation. So we are at Planning Commission today. If this goes well, we would take it to the first board meeting on November 5th. And then if the November 5th hearing goes well, we would clean up the ordinance and take it for adoption on December 10th. We do have an affordable housing committee in Manatee County. It meets to work on our local housing assistance plan. So they make recommendations to the board in a report and that report is used to draft the plan. In their, in their discussions on ADUs, they wanted to see the maximum square footage of ADUs to be increased to 750 square feet. Um, they wanted to only count air conditioned square footage. They didn't want any limitation on the number of bedrooms. Uh, these, these recommendations were discussed with the board at the work session, but we were, we were directed to proceed differently. And those changes are reflected in the draft ordinance, which we will be going over shortly. So the takeaway from the board work session was that they would like to see ADUs as a housing option, that they wanted larger ADUs in A and A1. So in RSF and plan development, 650 square feet was the maximum. They wanted it limited to one bedroom. In A1, people could get an ADU up to 1,000 square feet or 80% of the principal dwelling unit, and there was a limit on bedrooms to one. 
in A, they thought that there was enough room to do a little bit more, so we limited it to 1,000 square feet or 80% of the primary structure with no, no maximum number of bedrooms. They also wanted to see a percent coverage for, uh, established for lots in, in the regulation. And staff had looked at, um, we, we created a map that I'm going to show you in a minute, um, but staff had looked at aerials of existing subdivisions and uh, that might be eligible to or have the potential for ADUs. And we were only seeing in most of the subdivisions just a handful of, of um, lots that could possibly get ADUs in because some of them have pools, uh, some of them built as far back on the property as they could. So there's not a lot of opportunity for that 650 square foot um, minimum or maximum ADU. So I'd like to switch to the document camera if I could for a moment. So the map that you see before you is um, showing uh, potential locations for ADUs. These are potential. People that are interested in these, in these neighborhoods must meet all the requirements and get a building permit in order to build an ADU. But in the, in the diagram, only when we take out the coastal areas, when we take out the plan development, when we take out multifamily, when we take out commercial, all that's left is the areas in yellow. So there are not, it's not, even though this ordinance is countywide, there's not a huge opportunity currently. Now, plan development does have the ability to get ADUs, but in order to do so, they would have to go back to the board and have their, or, their um, development order updated to allow ADUs and, as, a, as a use. They currently do not have that in their development orders because we didn't have that use until, until if this gets passed. So currently, planned development is not eligible. It's not to say that new planned development could not ask for that use if, the, if adopted, but the planned development that you see on the map today did not get those approvals, so they could not have an ADU today. Could we go back to the PowerPoint, please? And the other thing the board asked us to do was to sunset existing guest houses and grandfather them in. So that is included also in the proposed language. They wanted, they were in agreement to reduce setbacks in exchange for height restrictions and privacy requirements. Um, this ordinance provides for either a five or 10 foot reduction in the setback depending on the type of unit that you're building. They wanted an off-street parking space regardless of the size. Um, they wanted ADUs prohibited in the coastal areas. And they did not want to regulate affordable housing or ADUs as affordable housing units. And what that means is a true affordable housing unit, you have to sign a, a land use restriction agreement. You have to agree to rent within certain rentals based on the, the size of the household, the income, and um, it's, it has to be monitored. So somebody from staff would have to monitor that. We're not expecting a lot of, you know, a rush of applications for ADUs, but it could be burdensome to have staff look at that on, a, on an annual basis. So changes to the ordinance from the prior version. And this would probably, a lot of this is from the version that, you, that the Planning Commission looked at about a year ago. So we reduced the maximum square footage for RSF and PD zoning districts from 1,000 to 650 square feet maximum. This includes covered porches and balconies and limits the um, ADU to one bedroom. The, and again, the board wanted to see a percentage of lot covered established in the ordinance. We already talked about this. I got a little bit ahead of myself, so I'm going to move on. Um, it's staff's opinion that um, 
the proposed regulations and site constraints will, will limit properties from having ADUs or could build 650 square foot ADUs. So we didn't see uh, we didn't see the necessity to add an additional level of regulation. So the the ordinance allows up to a thousand square feet or 80 percent of the primary resident whichever is less in A and A1 zoning districts, including covered porches and balconies. There's no limit on the number of bedrooms in the A zoning district. It limits the number of ADUs or grandfathered guest houses on a conforming lot to one. It prohibits ADUs in the coastal planning area, which includes the coastal evacuation and coastal high hazard areas and it requires a dedicated off-street parking space. Although not specifically proposed in the ADU ordinance, we did look at the Whitfield Residential Overlay District, and there is a section, section 40313, which requires a 950 square foot minimum floor area for other residential structures. They also cannot exceed 25% of the rear yard and they cannot be located with any required yard or setback. Section 403.13C2 has been amended to prohibit the construction of a secondary housing unit. Um, most of our opposition came from Whitfield residents. It appears that the majority of them don't want it. We already had an overlay, so it was easy to modify that to meet their request and unless the residents of Whitfield at a later time request an amendment to their overlay ADUs will be prohibited we also added section 519 that provides a sunsetting provision and a means of legally converting a guest house into an ADU and we also are allowing mobile homes to be used as ADU in the A zone zoning district only, and we propose revisions to the to the standards of mobile homes so that they could use a small mobile home as an ADU. And these are some floor plans that could be either stick built or um, or mobile home. Um, so it kind of shows you the layout. Um, if you don't have a lot of personal items, they are more than adequate for a couple people or possibly a couple people with a child. Uh, part of the reason why we were keeping the square footage as low as possible in the residential zoning districts was because the board did not want a whole family. Their intent was to provide a granny flat for an elderly parent or space for a child that's ready to leave the house or maybe for rental income to a small family a couple or maybe a couple with a child so these are a few different floor plans there's a lot of variability there's there's quite a bit of space i mean i've lived in a um park model over the course of my lifetime those are around 400 square feet and i thought that it was very comfortable the draft ordinance, as proposed, adds a definition for accessory dwelling units. It amends Table 4.1 and Table 4.12 to address ADUs. It amends Section 403.8C1 to prohibit ADUs in the coastal planning area. It amends Section 403.13C2 to pro prohibit secondary housing in the Whitfield Residential Overlay District. It adds Section 518 accessory dwelling units, which is the meat of the ordinance. This is the requirements that you would have to meet. We've already discussed them in prior slides, so I won't go over them again. But one of the other things that um, is included in this is that the, the structure must comply with uh, Florida Building Code if they're doing something you know other than stick built construction. And one of the things that um, the board had requested was that um, we have the owner um, sign a notice to buyer 
So if the property changes hands, the next owner knows that you don't have two, piece, two units that you can rent. That one that you're supposed to live on one of the one of the or you're required to live in one of the units. Um, it adds guest. We already talked about this. It adds the sun setting for guest houses, allows mobile homes, and then the final amendment amends Table 10-2 to address the parking requirements for ADUs. And that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Very good. Thank you. Um, questions? Mr. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I got a quick question. Sure. You brought the um, mobile homes um, aspect of the ADUs. Does that also include modular homes? Something like a Palm Harbor or an Affinity type home, which is a modular home um, built, delivered on site? I believe currently you're allowed to have it as long as it has a foundation that um, supports the structure that's in accordance with the building code. Okay, so on a mobile home, are you going to require that there is a pad put underneath the mobile home to sit on? Because a mobile home is basically still classified. They have to have a registration. They have to have a title on it, tag on it. Um, so are you considering that also that they have to have a slab underneath if it's a mobile home? I don't know what the building code requires for mobile homes, so they'll have to follow the building code. Um, but I do know that they can't just use the the, the auger type tie downs anymore. There's a much more substantial foundation requirement. Okay. Good. And just to add to that, um, someone can't pull in a a um, used mobile home and use it if it does not meet today's standards which most of the existing stock does not it cannot be used as an ADU okay thank you also one more question follow-up um, you discussed impact fees are you saying there will be impact fees charged yes there will okay so if I have a home an existing home and I'm gonna add 500 600 square feet to it to my existing home, a second story or whatever, or an extensive rehab, those aren't normally hit with impact fees. So how are you going to classify impact fees for one type of structure and not another? Because the, the, the addition is attached to the existing house and it doesn't, it's not intended to act as a separate dwelling unit. Because it is a separate dwelling unit, it will be assessed impact fees. Okay. Then again, follow up to that. If I have a detached garage, and I, I put a second floor on it for an ADU. Will that be hit with impact fees? Yes. So how are you going to classify impact fees on an existing structure? Um, as I had stated earlier, it's my understanding in talking with our impact fee section that they would be assessed the fee for 1,000 square feet or less. And it's basically... I believe there's four quadrants that they look at, so it would be based on the quadrant that they live in and the up to a thousand square foot rate. All right, thank you. Uh, related to the impact fee question, um, impact fees are broken out between single family and multifamily. Is it which of these would it be assessed as? It would be assessed as single family. Single family, and uh, the thing that I'm struggling with uh, to, to uh, have a clear understanding is. What what makes a um, like for example one of the one of the things you showed was an accessory dwelling unit within the existing structure. So what is the distinction between a, an expansion of the existing structure and the addition of a dwelling unit? Expansion of an existing structure cannot have a full operational kitchen, mm -hmm. and they generally do not have a separate entrance. Okay, so those are the are two of the criteria, uh, separate entrance and, because I don't think, I don't know if the one that was on on the existing house, I, I, don't, I didn't see if it had a it separate. It did have a separate entrance. I can pull that picture. No, that, that's fine. I, I was just struggling with how do you make the distinction. Um, I didn't know if it was maybe based on separate services, separate water and sewer services, where they would be billed separately or separate electrical services. Have those things been considered? They have been, and it, I believe it's going to be up to the homeowner as to whether or not um, they want separate utilities or if they have the ability to um, 
attached to their existing um, utilities and power. Mm -hmm. um, if someone is renting to a non-family member, I would guess that they would want them to pay the utilities as part as their pay their part of the utilities. So, the, in those particular cases, I would expect that they might have uh, separate meters and services. Okay. Um, one uh, one additional question, or at least one. Um, with regard to uh, communities that have HOAs, can they decide as a group to maybe um, enter something within their their documents or covenants, restrictions, uh, something that would not allow accessory dwelling units? Absolutely, and I failed to mention that when we were talking about not, why not everyone can have one. Mm -hmm. There are homeowners association documents, and quite a few of them do preclude the ability to build a secondary living unit. Okay. And then kind of the uh, kind of the other side of that, if, if there were communities that that was a like a target market, if a developer came in and decided they wanted to provide the ability for somebody purchasing a new home to have an accessory dwelling unit, and that was something they offered at the very beginning, it was in maybe it's a straight zoning or a, a PD type zoning, and that was an offer that they had or an option they had with when they decided to build a new house. Is this going to be counted as an additional unit with regard to density? No. So, okay. Mr. Mr. Chair? Yes. I'm sorry. Uh, I, had, I had a question. I see the, the letter from the school board. And have you done, I see you did a great job, by the way, helping us understand how many units could possibly be located in certain areas. Did you do any kind of analysis as to what the numbers totally could be if they were all built out? We have not. And um, this is something we will look at the school board's memo and have a discussion with them between now and the board meeting. Um, this kind of came up a bit late, so we didn't have time to really have any discussions. But um, currently, if you look at it as um, comparing an addition to an ADU, if you put on it, you could put on a much larger addition to your house that could house many more people than the ADU, and they don't currently do that type of assessment on an addition. And I think that was kind of my question is, with a single bedroom, the, I guess we could look to multifamily studies that tell us single bedrooms, how many kids do those typically add to the school uh, profile. But also the same question is, it doesn't give you any kind of sense of how many people live in a house and how many children they have and all that. So I, I guess a one bedroom, is there some analysis you would make based on a one bedroom, how many children that might impose on the school system? Well, we certainly will look at that um, between now and the board meeting. Um, because of the size of the units and the fact that they're only one bedroom, we're not anticipating that there would be a lot of children in living in these units. And, and do you think in the future, you said you had not done any study about what the potential uh, expansion is. I think it comes to a couple of questions. If, if I look at your chart, which I thought was interesting, and I think if... Um, if we had some people that could analyze that, the, the value of uh, fees would be very interesting to me. The question about how much impact into sewer and, and so forth uh, would be interesting to me, and certainly traffic. But, you know, with the parking space commitment, I do think that's interesting, although I think younger and older people might not have that demand. It would just be interesting to see if we could more accurately quantify what we think the numbers are, because I think my concern a little bit is when I see all those spots, what's that number? What's the impact of school? What's the impact of everybody involved? Uh, both positive and negative. But again, I, I understand that's kind of a, uh, a dart throw at the board, but I, I think some thought about that might be interesting. Okay. Well, I, I can tell you in the last presentation that you heard, Josh had, a, um, had information on how many guest houses were permitted over a 10-year period. And provided or granted guest houses are not the same as an ADU, but what we are finding is guest houses, which are only supposed to be used for occasional use, have been rented out and used as residences. And in his research, he found that over a 10-year period, only 70 permits were received. So we're not expecting a lot 
of interest, primarily because of cost. And if you can only have, I mean, there are units that are only 160 square feet. You may only be able to get something that small in your backyard, and that would definitely be not big enough for more than one person, possibly two. Understood. Mr. Spock. Uh, I got two points. One, one to Mr. Rutledge's position on, on school um, impact. We, we did have one person write in saying that she was excited about the, the concept because she intended to have or would like to have one built in her backyard so she could move into it and her children move into the main house, which could then bring children into the community, uh, not the parents and, and their family into a community that was being served, only being serviced to a, a single person. So that's you know, one aspect that should be considered when evaluating the, those numbers. Secondly, um, on property tax, uh, I, would, I would have to guess that um, if, you're going, if you're going to spend $80,000 to $100,000 on an ADU going into your yard, potentially significantly less, but would, would that obviously be assessed onto property value and would that property be exempt from homestead exemption or or would that impact the homestead exemption completely where someone who chooses to rent that property out could potentially lose their homestead i did have a discussion with the property appraiser on how they would assess taxes and they said that after construction that the entire um, just value or the value of the addition would be added in um, to the property value and it would start being taxed the next year. It's also my understanding that on new structures such as this, the property appraiser does do a site visit and they interview residents to ask them about what they're intending to use it for. If they say they're going to use it to rent, they are not subject, that, that portion of the property is not subject to Home, the homestead exemption and in fact their cap per year would be much higher I believe it was like 10 percent versus I think we have a three percent cap currently on on the appreciation of property from one year to another good information that's that's all information I think people need to understand when when considering this because that, that can have a huge financial impact right especially if somebody is trying to um, balance their income Absolutely. And, and their older age. Um, so the the property would be assessed separately. Uh, like a, it'd be a formula. It would have two components for the assessment. Okay. That's my understanding. Okay. All right. Interesting. And just, just a point of information, Mr. Chair. Like when you have an income producing property, that yield calculation is substantially different than building cost value. So when you do your home, it's only what the cost of the building and replacement, land costs, et cetera. When you have an income producing property, if it was in a a luxury area like on the on the coastlines where and we're not putting them there but but if you had it there the yield value might be substantially different and you might uh, double your your taxable value just by the yield of the rental mm -hmm. I'm sure there's a lot of things that haven't been considered and we won't <laughs> we won't know what these are until it's actually uh, somebody tries to use it so uh, very good all right um, I'm gonna go ahead and open this up for public comment is there anybody in the audience who wishes to come forward and make a statement or comment regarding this uh, this application or this item okay seeing no one come forward um, mr. Shea I'm sorry I have just I, I thought of one more question while uh, the others were speaking um, this isn't gonna have any bearing on for example, if uh, uh, there's not an accessory unit, like if there are, you know, the roommate situation, a lot of the younger folks maybe might rent a house and, and share it, um, even though there, as long as there's not the separate access, uh, separate entry and the things that were previously discussed, that, that doesn't, there's no intention to cause that to be kind of grouped into the same scenario, is there? No, um, it's my understanding, and I believe it's by state statute, that a family is defined as up to six different or okay. unrelated people. So as long as they're not exceeding uh -huh. um, that requirement, there would be nothing that we would regulate. It would be hard to do anyway because, right. you know, code enforcement has to be invited in 
um, to even investigate that, which most people would not probably grant them permission to do so. Yeah, Mr. Chair, we cannot regulate on the Fair Housing Act. We can't regulate families. Okay, very good. I and do want to also point out on this map that Mr. Shea showed you that it's only conceptual and staff hasn't checked whether there are private covenants in any of these properties. Right. So the property is eligible probably less than what you see here in yellow. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you. And then, uh, Mr. Shea, one one last question. I, I, I support everything that we've talked about. Um, just a thought for future consideration is um, not all properties are equal. If you're saying you're limiting um, the size of a unit on, say, a, a two and a half acre lot versus a quarter acre lot, it you know the the quarter acre lot, that's a reasonable presumption, but the two and a half acre lot you would think could handle a larger unit. It might be something that in in future considerations or modifications or amendments that um, the size of the lot be a consideration. Maybe the um, maybe that be included in any future modifications. Right. And we did try to try to take that into consideration when we bumped it up to a thousand square feet. Um, and the board, quite honestly, hasn't seen that. They may have a different opinion when they see it. We, they didn't give us a number in their direction. Mm -hmm. They just said that they would like to see um, larger units in the A and A1 zoning districts. Mm -hmm. And the last version that we had was the 1,000 square feet or 80%. So we went with what was recommended in the prior version for the A and A1 zoned lots. Very good. Thank you. All right, we're going to go ahead and close the discussion, and Chair, I'll open it up for a motion. Mr. Chair? Mr. DeLesline. I move to recommend adoption of Manatee County Ordinance 2015 LDCT 2030, or 2003, amending the Manatee County Land Development Code as recommended by staff. Very good. We have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Mr. Ron, second. Uh, any discussion? All right, hearing. I, I just like to say I think this is uh, very progressive. <clears throat> I like the idea. I think it, it solves a lot of problems. You know, Fifty-one percent of kids under 35 years old are, are now back with their parents, and I think this is a great solution for some of those. And so, I'm I'm fully in support of this. I'm sure we'll have to tweak it. It's mm -hmm. imperfect in its mm -hmm. initial form, but I, I like it very much. And great job by the staff. Tell them we appreciate very much this kind of insight. Agreed. Agreed. All right, uh, we'll go ahead and call the motion to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Chair votes aye. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. All right, we're going to go on to the next item, item number, I think in the agenda it's item number three. Yes. Uh, Summer Woods, Ms. Leiter, can you please read that into the record? Item number three, PDR 1919P, related to PDR 1414PR2. BK Summer Woods LLC Summer Woods PLN 1910-0011 amend preliminary site plan to add 488 lots and more or less 133 acres to an existing residential development for a total of 1050 units single family detached and single family semi detached an approval of amended stipulation for a site located three miles east of I-75, south of Mocasson Wallow Road, east of the future alignment of Sogras Road, and west of 115th Avenue East Palmetto in the PDR MCO, Plan Development Residential North Central Overlay Zoning District, and the total acre is 399.34 acres. It's a quasi-judicial case, and Mr. Rigo is the case manager here representing the applicant is Mr. Matt Morris for Morris Engineering. Very good, thank you. And uh, for the commissioners, have there been any ex parte communications regarding this application? No, sir. No, sir. No. All right, hearing none disclosed. Um, right, this is a uh, quasi-judicial quasi hearing, so if you intend to speak on this application, or any of the other quasi-judicial applications, please rise to be sworn in. If you don't do it now, you're going to have to do it later. And we'll all make fun of you. <laughs> do you swear or affirm that the factual statements and factual representations which you're about to present to the Planning Commission will be truthful and accurate? Thank you. Very good. Thank you. 
And uh, a bit of uh, housekeeping note, um, after each speaker, we're going to have somebody wipe down the, uh, the microphone speaking area. Um, so just please hang back a little bit, allow them to do their job. So, all right, very good. We're going to go on to the um, applicant's presentation, Mr. Morris. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Matt Morris with Morris uh, Engineering and uh, New Morris LLC. Uh, I've got some other members of our uh, project team here as well. Uh, from the uh, developer, um, we've got Mr. Greg Meath. Uh, we've got uh, Bill Merrill here, uh, here as well. Uh, we've got Frank Domingo from Stantec, who's our traffic consultant. And we've got uh, Joel Christian here as well uh, for uh, answering any environmental questions that may come up. Uh, during the presentation. Sorry, getting a lot of feedback on the microphone here. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a presentation prepared. Um, if we can pull that up. Thank you. Uh, so we're here uh, for a request for our Summer Woods project. Um, we came before this board, I think it was last October, uh, and then went to uh, the county commission in November uh, at the time requesting some additional density uh, to be uh, placed within the uh, existing confines of our uh, Summerwoods project. And there were some concerns at the commission. Uh, we heard those concerns with regard to access uh, through the project and, and things of that nature. Uh, so now we're back before you because we've added uh, some area into this project. We've added another parcel. Uh, we've also uh, gone back and looked at access for the project and uh, we think made the project better uh, than what we had uh, when we came into you guys here last year. Uh, so the project is located on Moccasin Wallow Road, uh, west of 115th Avenue, so that'd be west of the Copperstone uh, development. Um, the property owner is Coulter uh, Land. Um, the project site acreage that you see there, the 133 uh, acres, that's for the additional area that's being added in to the Summerwoods development. Uh, the existing land use for those areas is vacant, although there are portions of the existing Summerwoods uh, community that are uh, completed with construction, have homes uh, occupied and homes being uh, built as well. Um, the, uh, as I said, we were making some changes to our phase three area that I'll show you on a slide coming up when I uh, pull up the site plans here, as well as adding an, another area that we're calling phase four. Uh, this is for an additional 488 lots for a total of 1,050 residential units. We do have two uh, special approval requests, one to uh, reduce the front setback from 25 feet to 23 feet for front-loaded units. That is uh, a special approval that had been granted previously for this project as well. Um, so since we're coming in and opening everything back up again, we're, we're requesting that same uh, special approval uh, as well. And then also to reduce the setback on the south property line, uh, from 35 feet to 20 feet. Um, the 35 feet is a requirement when you're adjacent to active agriculture. Um, the property to the south of us, although it is currently active, agri well, I don't know if it's active, but it's currently agriculture, um, it has been approved as part of the Parish Lakes uh, development of regional impact. So it will be getting developed as residential property as well. So we felt that it was uh, appropriate to ask to reduce that setback from the 35 feet to the 20 feet. As I mentioned, uh, on the project site location, we're on the south side of uh, Moccasin Wallow to the west of the Copperstone development. You can see an aerial there. The, the area highlighted uh, in the yellow box is the area that we're proposing to change, uh, as well as the area that we're proposing to uh, add into the development. This is a, a copy of our approved uh, uh, final site plan, approved uh, site plan that is uh, being brought forward right now uh, as far as moving forward with our phase one construction and phase two construction. Uh, you'll see called out there, um, I think this works as a pointer as well. Okay. So phase one area is here. And this area has been uh, fully completed from a, constru a site construction standpoint. We've got homes that are being built uh, in those areas, homes that are occupied as well. This area here is our phase two area. That area has uh, received final site plan and construction plan approval and uh, infrastructure is being constructed right now. Uh, we're working on 
uh, moving forward to be getting ready to uh, certify our phase 2B. So the area uh, from the old site plan that we're specifically here to discuss today is our phase 3 area here and the addition of the phase 4 area, which you'll see on the site plan coming up here. So again, the previous approval uh, was for 562 units. Uh, they did have the uh, front setback reduction was approved at the previous approvals as well. Again, we're requesting to uh, maintain that uh, special approval moving forward to allow the 23-foot front setback uh, for the residential units. And this is our new uh, preliminary site plan that's before you today. Um, you can see the areas that we've grayed out on the plan. Uh, those are the areas that I mentioned before that have already received approval and already uh, under construction and uh, have homes uh, being occupied in them. Our phase three area here. And then this triangular piece of property to the north is the portion that's been added into the development here that we're calling phase four. Um, part of the uh, concern that uh, previously when we came last year was in regard to access. And uh, we think that we've uh, made the access to the site considerably better than what we had before. Uh, so I'll speak to the access very briefly. We've got one existing full access point here onto Moccasin Walla. This is a gated area of uh, Summerwood, so we've also got a uh, permanent emergency only access out to Moccasin Walla from the end of this cul-de-sac here. And we're now proposing uh, an additional full access on Moccasin Walla in phase four here. And we're also working with the Public Works Department on uh, working on a development agreement to construct uh, a portion of Sawgrass Road, which is along the west property line. And we would be constructing it from Moccasin Wallow down to this southern access point that we're proposing to the roadway. And there's another intermediate access point here as well. So we're currently working that through with uh, Public Works right now, and that'll be the subject of a developer's agreement that will uh, come before the commission here, hopefully uh, about the same time that we're bringing this project forward to the commission for our uh, preliminary site plan approval. Again, with the uh, uh, specific approval request that we're here for uh, today as well as the uh, front setback being reduced from 25 to 23 feet, uh, we've also uh, requested the addition of being able to uh, have some single-family semi-detached units uh, within the development, which would be uh, your paired villas. Um, so we're requesting the same thing for the paired villas. So these are the setbacks uh, that would apply to those as well. And uh, in conclusion, uh, our request is to increase the number of lots uh, occurring in the development area. Uh, we feel like we meet the strong community's objective by maintaining the existing landscape and not performing a radical change. Uh, other areas around this project are being developed and have been approved recently for development as uh, residential uh, subdivisions, so we're in keeping with that uh, trend in this area. Uh, we do exceed the open space requirement by approximately 25%. Uh, we'll comply with the applicable comp plan zoning and land development regulations as we move forward to final site plan and construction plan approvals. Um, a traffic study was completed and approved uh, by county staff with no concurrency issues, and that uh, traffic study will also be uh, the basis for the development agreement that will come before the board uh, fairly soon, and staff recommends approval. So with that, we appreciate it, and uh, happy to answer any questions that anybody might have. Very good. Uh, one question is Sawgrass it, on the county thoroughfare plan? Okay, so it is. All right, very good. All right, any other questions for the applicant? Okay, very good. Thank you. We'll, uh, I, I have one question. Oh, sure. Mr. Mr. Rutledge. Uh, <clears throat> in looking at your uh, site plan, compared to the description of the amount of wetlands impacted, it seems to me, and perhaps I, I can't de determine from the aerial, it seems like the impact of the wetlands is much more significant than the uh, two acres or so that's denoted. Is that just because those are pines, there's no real wetlands really in that area that you're covering up with houses? Uh, depending on which two acres you're looking at, and I'd have to uh, take a little closer look at the screen here, um, if you're looking at the site plan, there was a notation that we had for uh, wetland impacts specifically for our phase three and four. Um, and then there was another table that had wetlands for the overall project development. Um, Joel might be able to uh, help answer that question as far as exactly how many wetland acre, acres are being impacted. Um, so I'd ask Joel to come up and help with that one. 
Good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, Joel Christian, um, senior scientist with Ardura. I've been sworn. Um, a portion of Sawgrass Road right away has already been previously dedicated. So those that's not within the project boundary. So the, the part that was in the original approval for Sawgrass, um, on the western edge of the previous approval, that right away was dedicated for sawgrass, so it's not technically within the project boundary. Um, the the wetland impacts on the north end are about 1.32, I believe, um, and then so that the the wetland impacts are really limited to sawgrass road and another little access road clip some. Okay, so so the percentages and acreage that you have represented are pretty accurate, then, right? Yeah, there, this is an approved jurisdictional determination. The wetlands are already approved by the by the district. Okay. All right. Um, All right. Thank yeah. you. Very good. Thank you. Any uh, any additional questions for the applicant? All right. Very good. All right. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and open it up for um, staff presentation. Who do we have for staff, Mr. Rigo? Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Jim Rigo with Building and Development Services here for staff this morning. Um, pleased to be presenting to you VK Summer Woods LLC. I have been sworn. And um, the Summer Woods saga began in 2007. Um, it's got a it's come back to us in some form or another um, for modification six times, either administratively or before a hearing process. You last saw this August 8th of 2019. And uh, apologies in advance, I'm going to be parroting a lot of things that Matt just said, but uh, Rosina Leiter uh, created a, an excellent staff report, very comprehensive and, and complete. So I'm trying to just put together some uh, bullet points to uh, put that together for you in this presentation. Uh, first slide is the site characteristics. We're in the North County, of course, between Mox and Wallow Road, north of Erie. And the, the plan you see before you is uh, the entire site, phases one through three. And we felt it necessary that this all had to be included in this change. Uh, Matt already talked about phases one and two being completed and titled. Parts of it are uh, already built. Um, as we move around the site uh, to the north, you saw recently the McClure, Mox, and Wallow development. That's across the street to the north. Uh, to the west is the Sawgrass Road corridor, some of it already dedicated. Um, south of us is the Parish Lakes development of regional impact. And the Copperstone development is to the south and to the east. Uh, also to the east is Barbara Harvey Elementary School. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of this development, uh, actually all the development in phases one and two are already approved through final site plan. Next slide, please. This is our county generated GIS aerial. It gives you a clearer picture of what's entitled and built out. Next, please, an overview of the zoning and future land use. We are all zoned plan development residential. There's no need for a rezone. And the future land use uh, you see is UF3, urban fringe, maximum three units per acre. And uh, adjacent to us is uh, mixed use. And that's uh, predominantly in the Parish Lakes DRI. Next, please. As I mentioned, Summer Woods has a history with us dating back over 13 years and just thought it necessary to provide at least a um, Cliff Notes version. So here we go. In 2007, 191.38 acres was rezoned plan development residential with a 302 mixed use residential development. In 2009, a land development agreement was added to establish project concurrency. In September 2014, the board approved a PSP and an LDA amendment to revise the unit types from 562 single family detached units 
to 376 single-family detached residential units and at 186 single-family semi-detached residential units. So this introduced the villas and cottages to Summer Woods. And the plan was also revised to add a roadway connection over a stormwater pond connecting 115th Avenue East, and that's the connection that was near Barbara Harvey Elementary School. In 2016, there was an administrative redesign. What they did was they removed uh, five cul-de-sacs that uh, dead-ended to the south, uh, and, uh, and they added the, uh, uh, the LDA was also amended, I'm sorry, and approved by the board revising the number of units in the first phase from 281 to 168. Next, please. In December 2018, the preliminary site plan was revised, was revised by removing the access to 115th Avenue East and replacing it with a cul-de-sac. An emergency access was provided from the new cul-de-sac to Mox and Wallow Road. A temporary emergency access was added north of High Noon Trail to Mox and Wallow Road, and an internal gate was added in the eastern section of Phase 1. Also added was a pedestrian access from the easternmost cul-de-sac to the sidewalk along the south side of Mox and Wallow Road. And finally, in August of last year, the preliminary site plan was proposed for an increase from the previously approved 562 units to a total of 750 units. The additional units consisted of 188 single-family, detached and semi-detached homes with the additional units. Changes to roadways and stormwater management lakes were also shown on the revised preliminary site plan. This application was withdrawn after a re recommended continuance by the board and is replaced with this application. Next, please. So the current request is for the addition of 488 lots to the previously approved 562 for a total of 1,050 lots for single-family detached and semi-detached units and adds 133.33 133, acres for phase four for a total project area of 399.34 acres. That's the entire development. The additional 133 plus acres added to this request for phase four is part of the McClure Properties Limited, which was rezoned PDR with the county initiated rezone of 1990. Those rezones were typically approved with no plans no specific criteria or conditions, but were subject to the requirements of the LDC and the comprehensive plan. The design reflected in phases three and four of this version of Summer Woods is similar in design and is a compatible and is compatible with the surrounding approved developments. As with the prior approvals, the projected density at 2.6 does not exceed the maximums established in the comprehensive plan and the proposal falls into conformance with the existing development order. So next, I've just included the map that shows you where phase four is part of the McClure rezone that happened with the county-initiated rezone back in 1990. Next, please. So finishing out the current request, uh, there's specific approvals. This amendment reintroduces the single-family semi-detached residential product that was deleted in the 2016 change those the villas are back into the plan there are two specific approval requests with this application and the first one is left over from the 2019 request a reduction in minimum front setback from 25 to 23 feet for front load garage units um, we've ensured with their design their lot design that uh, they will still provide 25 feet from the front of garage to the back of sidewalk to not uh, obstruct uh, pedestrian access on the sidewalk. And second, uh, specific approval will be a reduction in the minimum of 35 foot wide setback required for yards adjacent to agricultural operations along the southern boundary of phase three. Agricultural operations has ceased at the Parish Lakes DRI and staff deems this to be a necessary but temporary condition which will disappear with the build out of parish lakes next please this plan shows the previous approval matt already showed you this 
Next, please, the requested modification. A quickly run down the table here, you see the dark shaded areas. Phase one is approved for 298 lots. Phase two is approved for 189. Phase three shows 188 lots. And phase four shows a flexibility of providing 307 to 375 dwelling units. This is for a total max of 1,050. Next, please. Positive and negative aspects. Positively, this development expansion is occurring on land previously zoned plan development, allowing the same densities approved with the existing Summerwoods development order. No further rezoning is required. Is required. The amended plan introduces the added road accessibility to Mox and Walla Road. And with the partial construction of Sawgrass Road, a total of three additional accesses have been added to Summer Woods. And these are all concerns and features that were discussed at the board meeting in 2019. The added vehicular accessibility to the west diverts trips from the previous main access nearer to Barber Harvey Elementary and 115th Avenue East. And the reintroduction of single family semi detached dwelling units creates a wider variety of housing types and the ability to potentially offer a more affordable product. There are more listed in your staff report, but we felt that these were the, the highlights of the positive aspects. Negatively, this is a large subdivision, potentially over 100,000 uh, lots, and residents adjacent to planned development and the thoroughfares may experience potential negative impacts such as noise, traffic, and light glare. And next, we have the mitigating measures, adequate separation, and expansive landscape open space. Over 51% will be provided to address compatibility with surrounding agricultural properties and residences. Staff recommends to the developer to add language to the covenants and restrictions uh, as a notice to the buyer informing future Summer Woods residents of the potential of the presence of potential agricultural operations around the, pro around the project. And the proposed 50 foot wide roadway buffering will help to minimize potential impacts related to increased vehicular traffic on the adjoining thoroughfares. Next. Our conclusion and recommendation is that the design reflected in phases three and four of this version of Summer Woods is similar in design as incompatible with the rest of Summer Woods and the surrounding approved developments. As with the prior approvals, the projected density does not exceed the maximums established in the comprehensive plan and falls into conformance with the existing development order. We recommend approval with several stipulations. So that concludes my presentation. I'll stand by for questions. Very good. Any questions for Mr. Rigo? Okay. Hearing none. Anything additional from staff? Very good. At this time. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to go ahead and open it up for public comment. So if there's anybody in the audience who wishes to come forward and make a comment regarding this application, uh, now would be your opportunity. Anyone at all? Okay, seeing no one come forward, um, we're going to close the public comment portion of this hearing and uh, go back to staff. Any staff closing comments? Seems pretty cut and dry. We've, been here uh, several times on this one, so. Okay, no, no staff closing comments. Any rebuttal to those blistering comments? So, okay, all right. Yes, Mr. Roth. Can you tell me the level of the, whatever the status will be of Marcus and Wallow and when it will be expanded? Nelson Galeano Transportation Planning. Mocansingualo. Um, and you've, and you've been sworn. And I have been sworn, yes. Mocansingualo okay. um, will have in the future uh, serve 
about 15 different developments mm -hmm. between uh, I-75 and 301. Mm -hmm. The road will be uh, improved to four-lane facility, uh, and the level of service of the facility will be between C and D. The, this is expected uh, in the long term to have six lanes on this uh, roadway. Right now, we are working with the design of four lanes, uh, having in mind that uh, it will be uh, improved to six lanes. So the, the design is currently underway? It, yes, sir. Is it when we say design is underway, has anything been submitted? Is there, is there a timeline, I guess, is probably the best way to ask the question regarding the expansion of the Moxon all over to four lanes? We have three segments on the Mocan mm -hmm. Um There are, um, as is on the CIP, mm -hmm. and the, the challenge we are facing right now is to design in such way that we m minimize the destruction, say, in that way, mm -hmm. of the four lane when we expand to six lanes. Mm -hmm. You are thinking ahead and when, when the additional investment comes, mm -hmm. when the lane, when the facility uh, goes from four lane to six lane. So you indicated it's already in the CIP for yes, sir, all yes, three yes. segments? Yes, yes, sir, yes. So if it's in the CIP, that would, I would presume it's probably going to occur within the next Five, five years. years. Yes, so. sir. Yeah, yes. Right. Okay. All right. Very good. Does that answer your question, Mr. Roth? I'm afraid so. <laughs> Very good. All right. Uh, anything else? Again, before we go, allow the applicant one more opportunity to rebut. So, okay. All right. We're going to. Okay. <laughs> um, do we have the correct facility? I mean, they're not going to do septic, are they? <laughs> For the record, Thomas Kirstenberger, Public Works Department Admin Sworn. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner Roth, uh, with respect to sewer, there is actually a force main that's under construction presently along Moxamwala Road that would serve, um, actually serve the uh, developments in this general area, both the uh, McClure project that just recently <coughs> went through public hearing last month and in addition to these um, subsequent phases of summer uh, summer woods that would tie into the uh, existing uh, sewer infrastructure down at Carter Road and then ultimately ultimately end up at the uh, North County Wastewater Reclamation mm -hmm. Facility. Adequate facility. Yes, that is Thank correct. You. Okay. <clears throat> Anything further? Okay, all right. Uh, we're going to go ahead and again give the applicant one more opportunity to make any rebut rebutting statement. Okay, all right. Applicants waiving their right. We're going to go ahead and close the uh, the hearing, and chair will uh, entertain a motion Mr. or chair. open it up for discussion. Mr. Ron. Mr. Chair, I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to make a motion. Yes. I would recommend adoption of Manti County Zo Zoning Ordinance number PDR 1919P as recommended by staff. Very good. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Roth, second. Any additional discussion? Okay, hearing none, the chair is going to call the matter to vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, like sign. Chair votes aye. Motion passes 6 0. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. We're going to go on to the next application, which is number four. And I believe that is the uh, Braden Point. Uh, Application, Ms. Leiter, can you please read that into the record? Item number four, PDR 2004G, Braden Point, B and H Cattle Company Owner, MAS Development Corporation Contract Purchase, PLN 2002-0077. Approval of a general development plan for a 323 single family and multifamily residential unit project. The site is located at the southwest corner of US 301 and 38th Avenue East and is commonly known as 3A06 City Street East Bradenton. And the total acres is 35.88. It's a quasi judicial case. Ms. Dorothy Rainey is the case manager and he represented the applicant as Mr. Bob Smith and Mr. Scott Russell. 
Very good, thank you. And for the record, have there been any ex parte communications regarding this application? No. no. Okay, hearing none, we're gonna go ahead to um, applicant presentation. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Uh, for the record, my name is Scott Rudisell with Blaylock Walters. I'm here on behalf of the applicant, uh, MAS Development. And with me here is Bob Schmidt, who's the planner on our case. And we also have uh, Mark Adler with George F. Young, um, who's the project engineer. And I'm just gonna give a brief overview here uh, before I turn it over to Bob. Yes, that was Thank you. Okay. Uh, so this is the project site. It's approximately 36 acres located northwest corner of US 301 and 44th Avenue East. This is a little closer look. Um, as you can see, the site's surrounded on all sides by arterial and collector roadways uh, with 301 and 44th Avenue East, as I mentioned, and then along the north is uh, 38th Avenue East and then 30th Street East on the east side. Uh, the site has a Res 9 future land use designation. You can see there's some Res 6 to the north and the east, uh, some Res 9 to the south, and then light industrial across 301 to the west. Uh, site's been planned for high density residential for some time, which is appropriate uh, given its location here along the 301 corridor, and especially now that it's at the intersection um, with 44th Avenue East. The project is also infill development, which is encouraged under your comprehensive plan. Site has PDR zoning, uh, and that is the existing zoning. So the application that's before you today is not a rezone. Uh, we're simply seeking general development plan approval for the site. And what's proposed is a maximum of 323 residential units with flexibility as to the unit type. So it includes a potential for multifamily, townhome, and or single family detached. Uh, the site received the PDR zoning back in 2007 with the Manatee Cove project. Uh, that project predated the extension of 44th Avenue East through this area. Um, and it also included the PDR property that you can see to the to the south of 44th Avenue East. Um, and a portion of that piece, as you can see on the map, has is, is been converted to a charter school. Uh, Manatee Cove project was approved for 558 units uh, with affordable housing and workforce housing. And it also included a mixture of housing types like is proposed today. Um, at the time Manatee Cove was approved, there were some concerns raised by nearby residents regarding the affordable housing component. Um, that Manatee Cove plan also showed units along the eastern boundary adjacent to the residential areas. So those were both things that, um, that were concerns at the time. We've addressed both of those issues, which Bob is gonna get into. Um, and we think that the residents will see this plan as an improvement. So with that, I'll turn it over to Bob. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Planning Commissioners. For the record, my name is Bob Schmidt with Land Planning Associates. I'm a certified planner, and I have been sworn. Um, Scott laid out a lot of things that I had in my, my presentation, so I, I, won't, uh, I won't hit on some of the things you've already heard. Uh, there is a lot of history to this site, as Scott mentioned, having been rezoned to PDR back in, in 07. 
Uh, and as he mentioned, we're not asking for a rezone of this piece. We're just asking for a new uh, site plan approval. Um, what I'd like to do is show you what was previously approved. And to Scott's point about um, the residential being across the street from uh, the existing subdivision called Highland Ridge, I just want to show that. All right, Highland Ridge is a subdivision to the north of this site. Um, again, the, the site plan that you see uh, shows 44th kind of going down the middle, and this application is only to that area left of 44th or to the north of 44th, south of, uh, of 30th Street East, and then there's 38th on the west, and three, I'm sorry, three, 38th on the uh, north and 301 on the, on the south. Um, and you see in the design that there was uh, a row of single-family residential homes, and there was a mix of multifamily and single-family. Uh, our client on this project wants to maintain that potential mix because of uh, changing market conditions. When this project is eventually built, we're not sure if it's going to be single-family, multifamily, or even a townhome component. The developer has a lot of experience in those types of uh, projects. Sorry. <laughs> um, this is our general development plan. And what we did in um, response to, uh, as Scott mentioned, what we did in response to some of the previous concerns from the adjacent subdivision was uh, to put our stormwater ponds on the east side of the site. You can see them there. And uh, there is also a wetland um, that uh, is not, there's no impact to that wetland whatsoever. So all the development of the site will take place where you see the bubble and it says develop residential development pod. So um, again, it, we've got different unit types, which I'll show you next. And this time, get it right. There you see the different types of residential uh, units. We've got villas down in the uh, lower middle, single family detached, a couple of examples. Townhomes up there in the center middle um, on the top, and then there's multifamily. Uh, again, this is just sort of a, a representation of what could be built there. Um, on the 35.88 acres, uh, we, with a Res 9 future land use category, we could accommodate up to 323 units. Uh, Scott mentioned that this is a good infill project. It's, it's amazing that this uh, piece has been vacant for as long as it has, um, especially since it had previous approval. Um, it's a consistent project for the area. Uh, did, we did meet with the uh, Highland Ridge HOA um, with the, the president and the secretary. Uh, they were very accommodating, very good folks to talk to. Um, and uh, they like this plan, I believe. I can't speak for them, but they like this plan better than the previous approval. So with that being said, uh, I did review the staff report and uh, concur with its findings. And um, as a certified planner, I ask for, we ask that you approve this project. And uh, so that's, that's our, our request. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Schmidt, I have a, a couple questions. With regard to the proposed mix, it sounds like a portion of them could be uh, fee simple ownership and a portion could be rental units. Is that correct? That, that's a possibility, yes. Okay. We, didn't, we didn't want to give that possibility up. Okay. All right. And then um, in the graphic that was included in the package and the one you put up, it looks like the, the roundabout to the um, north uh, northeast corner would not be utilized, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Access would be on 38th at the roundabout down close to 301, and then out to 30th Street East, which matches with the drive or the entrance to Highland Ridge. Okay, and the, the um, stormwater facilities that were kind of carved out of the project, or the uh, development area, I, 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 I don't know if that was how it was called, residential development pod, are those to serve this project, or are they for the roadway? Just this project. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Any any additional questions for the Mr. Rutledge? Yeah, I had a question about the uh, 
the uh, water retention going into that southeast corner. It shows some on the uh, young design water coming from other locations. So I just want to make sure that uh, the design is going to be adequate to take those off-site things that are intended or have been going there historically along with the design development that you have proposed. Um, Mr. Rutledge, I'll, I'll let Mark Adler, our engineer, answer that question if that's okay. Mr. Rutledge, are you referring to the like the conveyance passing through the site? Yes, okay. I, I looked at the 100-year flood plan and there looked like there was water coming from other locations. I just want to make sure that the collective re resolution is adequate for all those components that are going in there. Uh, yes, uh, uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Planning Commission members, uh, Mark Adler with George F. Young. Um, but a civil engineering consultant for the applicant, and I have been sworn. Thank you. Yes, that is the uh, intention to Mi be able to handle on site, off site. M Mr. Adler, it actually looks like it's flowing to the north, uh, northeast, and not the southwest. Is that correct? Where it's collecting it on site and then flowing it out? Is that correct? You're talking about the North Pond versus the, uh, the, the Wetland North Pond? A and the conveyance that collects it and takes it off site. The and I'm sorry. The, and the question again is: it, it, it is water flowing into the site through the the ditch system or flowing out of where the the ditch that's associated essentially with wet uh, Wetland A. You're with Young, right? <laughs> correct, correct, correct. I, I was not the joke. Uh, I'm sorry. Sorry. I, I was not the the project engineer on I, I the project. Know, I but, it was a joke. I'm sorry. Understand. Give me, Mr. Chair. So, oh, Mr. Mr. Gersenberger. Um, I might have a little bit of uh, additional knowledge on this subject that might be beneficial. Sure, if you would, please. For the record, <clears throat> excuse me. For the record, again, Thomas Gersenberger, Public Works Department. I have been sworn. Um, what I no, that's good. Thank you, Chris. Um, what you see on this aerial map, and I'll point it out to you. Is um, what is what I used to uh, use the pen to point out was uh, the one of the stormwater facilities associated with the uh, recent construction of 44th Avenue East between US 301 and 30th Street East. Um, that particular uh, stormwater detention facility, which serves 44th. Um, actually outfalls into what essentially became a severed wetland. Um, so it, the outfall from that detention pond into the wetland um, south of US, uh, excuse me, south of 44th Avenue East, uh, then crosses uh, via Culver Crossing underneath 44th Avenue East. As I'm tracing out, continues um, through the project area uh, towards the northeast and up to 30th uh, Street East itself. So as the uh, general development plan reflects, uh, the applicant is retaining the conveyance system, um, which is uh, essentially a county um, outfall conveyance system for 44th Avenue East uh, through this development and up to 30th Street East. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Rutledge, does that address your question? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's my concern is, you know, it, it's coming in a secondary condition after this other design has been put in place. I want to just make sure we at least preserve it. And generally, as I asked Mr. Gersenberger, is it going to be better after they finish <laughs> or not? You could just nod. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Rutledge, uh, in addition to preserving the existing conveyance system, this project will also, will also be reducing their uh, pre-development allowable rate of runoff by 50% for this particular watershed. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. All right. Any additional questions for 
um, the applicant. All right, very good. All right, we're going to go ahead and open it up to staff presentation. You want to repeat that again, Tom? Good morning, Dorothy Rainey for staff, and I have been sworn. Thank you. Good Thank morning. You. My presentation, of course, will echo pretty much what <laughs> what the applicant has already proposed, but I'll go through it. Um, Braden Point B and H Cattle Company is the project name. Um, the request is to approve a general development plan for up to 323 single-family and multifamily residential units on an already PDR zone 35.88 acre parcel. The future land use category, as the applicant's presentation pointed out, is Res 9 with um, Res 9 to the south and then a lot of uh, Res 6 to the east and to the north. And then, of course, across 301, you've got industrial light and industrial heavy. Zoning, again, is planned development residential, as is a portion to the south of um, 44th Avenue, which was part of the original project when it rezoned. There's aerials of the site. The site information, general site information, it's one parcel, 35.88 acres. It's already zoned PDR and Res 9 feature land use category. And the two access points will be one off of 38th Avenue East, where the roundabout is, and one off 30th Street East in the center of the frontage of that side of the, proper, the project. The surrounding uses to the north is a church in North neighborhood commercial medium zoning. There's Fair Oaks subdivision, which is zoned RSF 6, and some large lot residences zoned A1. To the south is vacant property and a charter school use, all in PDR zoning. Um, and to the east is the Highland Ridge subdivision, zoned RSF 4.5. To the west is US 301 right away, and to the west of that is uh, the vacant land zone light manufacturing. Um, the residential uses that will be uh, proposed on the site, um, it's, it's already rezoned to PDR, part of the larger project that the applicant also had mentioned. It was originally 62.44 acres with 558 single family and multifamily units approved back in June 2007. Of course, they had a higher density because of their affordable housing component. The current request is for the maximum allowable gross net and net density without any density bonuses of the nine gross dwelling units and 16 uh, net dwelling units per acre. The site layout, um, as the applicant has shown you, um, there is uh, there are two access points, one off 38th Avenue East on the north northwest corner there and one off of 30th street the stormwater facilities have been proposed along the east boundary to provide some uh, buffering between this project and any surrounding projects um, and t there's also a wetland and wetland buffer to be preserved adjacent to the facilities and the residential pod is in brown where all the residential development will occur and there's what i just went over um, so the positive aspects are that the site is already zoned PDR and was previously approved with a gross density of actually a gross density of more than nine of nine dwelling units per acre. So they they um, had the density bonus. But the, pro the other positive aspect is that it will provide a variety of housing units to provide for much needed housing in the area. Negative aspects. The site abuts US 301 Highway, which may have noise impacts to the residential uses to be developed on the site. And also no specific design layout has been provided with the GDP to evaluate the project for compliance with section 402.6 uppercase F of the LDC for superior design. Mitigating measures, um, stipulation A3 is provided to require a noise study and to provide mitigation for noise impacts from US 301 with compliance to be demonstrated at the final site plan. So staff recommends approval of the general development plan and the specific approval request with stipulations. And that's all. Thank you. Very good. Any questions for staff? Okay. All right, very good, thank you. All right, 
Uh, we're, I don't have any speaker cards for this uh, application, but I'm going to go ahead and open it up for public comment or questions. If anybody wishes to come forward and make a comment, uh, please do so. And again, this is quasi uh, uh, this is a quasi judicial, so you must be sworn. So if you could state your name and that you have been sworn and you'll have three minutes. No, I have not been sworn. Okay. All right. Um, Again, if anybody intends to speak on any of the uh, remaining applications, please rise to be sworn in. Um, the remaining ones are legislative, so. Do you swear or affirm that the factual statements and factual representations which you're about to present to the Planning Commission will be truthful and accurate? I do. Thank you. Very good, thank you. All right, and again, uh, if you could state your name and that you have been sworn and you'll have three minutes. Yeah. Uh, my name is Josh Lopez. Good morning. I've been sworn. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, have, I live in Highland Ridge. I've been living there for uh, 12 years now. It's a great community. I would like to see, you know, homes built there similar to our homes. And I'm very concerned about the rentals or the multifamily homes. Uh, very concerned about that. I don't have a lot of information. This is kind of new to me today. I'm glad I'm here and I'm listening to all that. Uh, so I would like to see the area being developed, but I'm very concerned about the rental. I don't think uh, we would like that in our community. Very good. Thank you. And uh, you uh, have the opportunity to interact with the applicants today. So uh, if you would, maybe um, touch base with them and provide them your contact information. I'm sure they'd be happy to, to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Is there anybody else in the audience who wishes to come forward and speak on this application? Anyone at all? Okay, seeing no one else come forward, we're gonna close the public comment portion of the uh, hearing and uh, open it back up to questions from uh, the commissioners, so. I have a question for the applicant. Okay, for the applicant. Yeah. Bob, you got a second? Thanks. Just real quick. Um, you show two ingress and egress on this property coming on to off of 38th and off of 30th. Do you anticipate that the majority of the traffic from this project will go in and out from 30th Avenue East? And would you also or maybe anticipate putting a signalized light at 30th Street East? Because right there you have two neighborhoods coming right on the 30th. Two Can you restart? Yeah. No, go ahead, Bob. You, okay. you weren't on the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, that was discussed with the HOA folks at Highland Ridge, and I understand that. Um, we did do a traffic impact statement, a TIS, for this application, and uh, it, it identifies that the majority of the trips will go out that entrance to 30th Street. Um, but do we anticipate a light? I don't believe that that is merited in the TIS. We will have to do a full-blown traffic study when we do the final site plan, uh, but I don't think there's enough traffic on, on 30th. The analysis didn't require it, and I don't think that there's enough. But of course, uh, Nelson or Mark Adler can address that as well, if, you, if you'd like. Very good, thank you. Uh, I do have a, just a question related to the, um, the neighbor's comment. Were the architectural graphics provided to the, um, to the folks in the adjacent community during the uh, interactions you had? Yes, they were. Okay. All In right. fact, I, I don't know, but we have communicated by email, and I think that they distributed amongst the community as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. And uh, to Mr. Ron's question, just a general question regarding how traffic signals um, are provided on county roadways. Um, what what is the process to determine the feasibility or the need for a signal? Is it similar to like a DOT where you do some type of um, needs analysis to uh, to um, justify the need for a signal at a at a location? Nelson Galeano, Transportation Planning, and I have been served. Um, the county follows the manual of uniform traffic. Um, devices. It means uh, uh, it contains a regulation with the name Traffic Signal Warrant Analysis. This is a detailed analysis with nine 
different rules that we follow to establish if a traffic signal is needed. And that is one of the, of the possibilities. Other possibility could be also uh, to use the intersection control evaluation that this is a, a state regulation. Um, sometimes uh, a signal is feasible, but for safety concerns, uh, a, tra a roundabout could be also applicable. Uh, uh, not only the traffic flow is the main reason to consider a signal. Uh, there are also um, concerns about safety, about the type of users, because um, people walk and bike, and intersections, sig uh, signalization of intersections sometimes depend on the uh, specific um, conditions of, uh, related to the location of the intersection uh, um, uh, requires a, a deeper analysis. Uh, um, based on our experience, uh, uh, we need, of course, a, a detailed analysis, uh, but based on the traffic volumes right now, uh, uh, a traffic signal, uh, uh, we don't see the need right now of a traffic signal. But again, this is, uh, uh, this is a matter of uh, a detailed study during the uh, final site plan. So, uh, in short, there's a process by which to yes, evaluate. Uh, there is a detailed process to establish the need of not uh, or, or a traffic signal or uh, any device that controls uh, uh, and mitigates the impacts of the development on the roadway, essentially uh, on the axis. Okay, very good. Um, oftentimes we hear DOT referenced when we're talking about signals and I don't know that we've had opportunity very frequently to talk about county signalization, but appreciate the explanation. Thank you. I'm good. Okay, thank you. Any, uh, Mr. In, Mr. Rutledge? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I, I recall when we changed the codes where we don't necessarily make all the analysis on the the rezoning like this. So we don't know the detail. So one of the things I wanted to say to the, the public is, John, we don't at this time analyze all the things that will be built there. Uh, experts in providing this show us all kinds of options, so we don't know. What I would say to you is to monitor this, stay in touch with the commission that will ultimately vote on this, and at some point they'll have to kind of uh, expose what they really intend to do. We don't know that today, and so we can't say, well, it doesn't meet the character, so our, our reach on comment is kind of limited. But I, but I do think that they've shown some interesting things, which are townhomes and so forth, and I would say that the market is, is getting sensitive to the high number of multifamily units being delivered, and so I think the market's going to have some impact on that. But I would just say that at this point, we don't know that answer. Your question doesn't really... Uh, we don't have any traction for that today, but that will become available, and it will come back, not to us necessarily, but to the commission. So I just advise you and your neighbors and your family and everybody to make sure you monitor that, because they're going to have to describe what they intend to do, and then they'll have to ask for that right. So that's kind of the process. Don't, don't lose sight of the conduct of what's going on here. Is that, isn't that correct, Mr. Chair? <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> I would like to have to get approval to talk. You know, yeah. That staff include... Uh, um, and uh, various stipulations regarding the potential location of um, multifamily and the separation for the road at the 38 and the northern, which are existing um, residential, single family residential units in order to help with, to achieve compatibility in the future. Mm -hmm. And other stipulations related to the maximum high and the sick bags. Very good, thank you. And being a, a, a general development plan was um, provided as opposed to a preliminary site plan where there's more detail, uh, a lot of those um, conditions or stipulations are by narrative or by, by text and not represented on a plan, so it's a little bit harder to get an understanding if you're not familiar with um, what we have here. So. And, and having seen a few of these, Josh, there are five pictures mm -hmm. and only one of them is multifamily. Mm -hmm. But generally, people make a lot more money in multifamily. Just, uh, <laughs> just, just not say. everybody's in it for the money. Yeah. Just no you. way. <laughs> when did that Some happen? Just to While housing. I was away. <laughs> <laughs> All right, very good. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, uh, open it up for discussions, questions, uh, anything further for staff and then or the applicant. If not, I'm going to close the public testimony portion, and we'll go to or the uh, the. Uh, 
dialogue and go to staff closing comments and rebuttal. So, okay, hearing nothing further, any staff closing comments? No. Very good, thank you. Uh, applicant rebuttal. Uh, just very briefly, and again, Scott Rudisil for the record, following up on Mr. Rutledge's comments and uh, Ms. Leiter's comments, uh, there is a stipulation um, that would prohibit any multifamily from being within 200 feet of the eastern boundary of the project, and I don't think that's been said yet. So okay. that goes to uh, Mr. Lopez's concerns about the, the compatibility there with multifamily. So we don't know if there's going to be multifamily. Uh, like Mr. Rutledge was saying, uh, townhome may be more likely, um, but if there is any multifamily, it's going to be set back a significant distance from the east, eastern boundary. And I don't have any additional comments. We're in agreement with the staff uh, report and stipulations. Okay, very good. Thank you. All right, we're going to close the, uh, the public hearing and open it up for deliberation, uh, discussion, or the chair will consider a motion. I'd like to make a motion since I was so tough on Mr. Young's uh, representative to, <laughs> uh, that we uh, accept the recommendations of staff to approve it. Uh -huh. Very good. Uh, in accordance with the uh, written motion. You want me to read that? No, you can okay. just uh, reference it. In accordance it. with said, uh, <laughs> said uh, submission. You, you haven't been in person for a while, so I have to harass you. I know so. you miss me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, Mr. Rutledge has made the uh, provided motion. I'll is second. Mr. Ron, second. Any discussion? Okay, hearing none, the chair is going to call the matter to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Chair votes aye. Motion passes 6 0. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Acevedo, do you need a break? Okay, we're going to go ahead and take a 10 minute break. So we'll, we'll resume at uh, approximately 1110.
Um, the next applications we have are going to be open together. Number uh, uh, item number five and item number six will be opened together, and uh, will be will be heard at the same time. So, Miss Lidar, can you read applications number five, item number five and number six into the record, please? Yes. Item number five, PDR 1409PR, Meritage Home of Florida, INC owner, Savannah, PLN 2004-0006. Amend zoning ordinance number PDR 1409CP and preliminary site plan to remove 5.23 acres from the boundaries of the project for a total development area of 299.16 acres maintaining previously approved entitlements, 475 single-family detached residential units located on the south house of State Road 64, more or less 800 feet east of the intersection of State Road 64 and Rye Road, and is commonly known as 4810, 4820, and 4850 Lorraine Road, Bradenton. Item number six, 
que es C2006 Savannah Commercial Reason, Meritage Home of Florida, ENC Owner, Casto Net Lease Properties, LLC Contract Purchase, L PLN 2004-005, Reason from PDR Plan Development Residential to GC General Commercial Zoning District, located south of State Road 64, More or less 500 feet south of White Eagle Boulevard, Brainington, on more or less 523 acres. Both applications are quasi judicial. The case manager is Ms. Dorothy Rain, and he represented the applicant as Katie Lavar from Stantec. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Um, for the uh, for the commissioners, have there been any ex parte communications regarding this application? No. Mr. Rutledge? Uh, I, I have not spoken to anybody about this particular application, but I just want to advise the, the chairman and the, our legal staff that I'm a former employee of the Casto Group. I'm not involved in any way in this. I no longer have any association with them, but I want to fully disclose that I have um, a lot of history with them. Is that material to the vote? No, you have no voting conflict. Okay. Thank you. So uh, let the record show that there were no ex parte communications, nor were there any voting conflicts. So very good. Mr. Chair, do you want me to view the time limits? Yes, ma'am, please. I've gotten them correct for you. Please. Okay, the applicant made a timely request for additional time for rebuttal, and Mr. Lobeck requests additional time. So upon discussion with the chair, He's proposing giving the applicant a total of 30 minutes to present because they're doing two applications, five and six. Um, Mr. Lobeck would have 30 minutes to present. Um, citizens are three minutes. Rebuttal, I said the applicant requested 15 minutes. And normally we give groups greater than five, 10 minutes, but we'll have to see if there's any groups. Thank you. Very good. Okay, and now Ms. Labar, if you could please. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. I'm Katie Labar. I'm a, a certified planner with Stantec, and I have been sworn. I'd like to quickly introduce our project team. I have with me today Mr. Dan Moyer um, with Casto Southeast Realty Group. I also have Mike Chadwick, also with Casto Southeast Realty Group, and uh, Mr. Ed Vogler, uh, attorney with Vogler Ashton. I'm going to provide to you a quick overview of the applications that are before you for consideration today. After I give my comments, I'm going to ask Mr. Mike Chadwick to speak to you about some of the signature projects that they have completed and executed throughout Manatee County. And then Mr. Ed Vogler will, will come up and he will address uh, legal matters regarding this application and give some closing remarks. Uh, to orient everyone to the site, the project area is located on the southeast, near the southeast corner of State Road 64 and White Eagle Boulevard. You see the location outlined in red on your screen. The project is entirely within the urban fringe three dwelling units per acre future land use category and is currently zoned planned development residential. And we'll get into the details of that here shortly. What we're proposing today is that the 5.23 acres be rezoned from PDR to general commercial. As, as you stated earlier, we did ask that both applications be opened together. Uh, we think that it makes a lot of sense to talk about them together because they are absolutely interrelated. The first application that, uh, that is before you is PDR 1409PR, Meritage Homes of Florida, Savannah. Uh, that request is to amend the preliminary site plan to remove 5.23 acres from the approved preliminary site plan. That modification results in a project acreage reduction from 304 acres to approximately 299 acres. With that change, the density, the overall project density, increases from 1.56 to 1.59 DUs per acre. Um, this also results in a reduction of open space from 51% to 50.45%. I will note that the plan development residential uh, zoning regulations do require a minimum uh, open space requirement of 25%. And so as you see, 
when it was originally approved, it more than exceeded. And even with this amendment, it continues to more than exceed that requirement by 50%. The second application we have before us today is Z2006, Savannah Commercial Rezone. Again, it's a rezone application of 5.23 acres from planned development residential to general commercial. Uh, with this rezone to GC, we propose development of neighborhood serving and commercial retail uses. We spent a lot of time meeting with staff, talking about the best approach and, and what made sense for this site. And uh, through those conversations, staff did recommend that we proceed in this manner, and we certainly agree with the approach that we've taken. As it relates to our request to remove the project site from the existing approved PDR project, staff concludes the following, and I quote, the 5.23 acre parcel being removed from the originally approved project is more than appropriate for non-residential development as it is located within a commercial node." End quote. And then another quote, staff sees no apparent or notable negative impacts. The subject property is located approximately 600 feet east of the intersection of White Eagle Boulevard and State Road 64. The rezone to general commercial is appropriate along an arterial roadway with access to two major thoroughfares. Neighborhood and community serving commercial uses will serve the existing and emerging neighborhoods within very close proximity of the site. Infrastructure also exists to support this commercial development. The requested rezone is consistent with several policies of the comprehensive plan, including those related to commercial nodes. I'm going to share some of those policies specifically with you today. Policy 2.10.1.1 says, encourage the development of new commercial uses as infill development and discourage the expansion of existing commercial areas not meeting commercial locational criteria contained in Objective 2.10.4. Policy 2.10.1.2 .2 also states, promote the development of commercial uses in nodes and discourage scattered incremental commercial development. And finally, mixed use policy 2.10.1.3 states, encourage development projects that functionally mix residential and commercial or retail office uses, either vertically or horizontally. What we have before you today is is absolutely a horizontal mix of commercial and residential uses to serve the neighborhoods that are nearby. This rezone request to general commercial is also consistent with the policy goals of the recently amended land development code, which encourages us, the development community, to pursue Euclidean zoning districts. As it relates to compatibility, the site, as I've said, is adjacent to State Road 64, an arterial roadway. Uh, the site is separated from the existing neighborhood by Prairie View Drive and the expansive wetland system of the Mill Creek. The intended uses will be built in compliance with all of the requirements of the Land Development Code, and the design elements will comply with and maintain the architectural integrity of the Lakewood Ranch architectural design requirements. The Land Development Con Code contains very rigorous standards for screening, buffering, setbacks, and open space, and your professional staff recognizes that commercial uses at this site are appropriate when they state the following, quote, the site is large enough to accommodate non-residential buildings and provide adequate setbacks, buffers, access, parking, and loading areas as required for commercial sites according to policy 2.10.4.3 of the comprehensive plan. They also state the area around the commercial node has been developed with residential communities that require infrastructure to be put in place. Development within the commercial node, uh, such as what will occur on the subject site, will be able to utilize the infrastructure and will be providing the neighborhood support commercial re and retail uses uh, to surrounding residential communities. And we think that's good planning. As it relates to appropriate timing, other facts that confirm, uh, confirm this are that 
The site will have direct access to State Road 64, and Prairie View Drive will provide access to the adjacent neighborhoods without the necessity of accessing State Road 64. The site is also walkable and bikeable to many adjacent residences. Prairie View Drive, again, will connect to White Eagle Boulevard, so the neighborhoods of Central Park, Indigo, Mallory Park, Arbor Grand, Eagle Trace, Serenity Creek, and Savannah will have easy and convenient access to the site. To comply with all codes and ordinances regarding setbacks, buffers, parking, internal access, and landscaping, the amount of building square footage will ultimately be reduced substantially below that which is allowable. We know that you've received public comment from residents and concerned citizens, and I've offered general information about the separation of the site to the homes within Savannah. As you can see from this exhibit, the nearest residence is uh, 600 feet away from the site and separated by the significant Mill Creek wetland system, which provides a dense vegetative buffer. As it relates to the school bus stop, uh, you will see again, it's located just beyond the gated entrance to Savannah, as it's shown in the exhibit that you have before you. Uh, site circulation associated with the proposed commercial development will not impede in any way school bus circulation or the use of the bus stop by the residents <coughs> of Savannah. And then finally, I just wanted to share with you that we did host a virtual neighborhood meeting on September 9th, and that meeting was well attended by residents. They had an opportunity to ask questions, and we were able to provide answers uh, to several of those questions. And so we did reach out to the community um, for that communication. In closing, it's my professional opinion that the amendment to PDR 1409-PR removing the commercial site from the PSP in the development order and then rezoning the site to general commercial as requested in Z20-06 is consistent with the requirements of the Land Development Code and Comprehensive Plan. The staff reports that were presented by staff are accurate, they're positive, and the request furthers several important policies of the county's comprehensive plan. With that, I'd like to introduce Mr. Mike Chadwick with Casto Southeast Realty Group. Thank you. And if you could uh, please state your name and that you have been sworn. Good morning. Mike Chadwick with Castle Development, and yes, I've been sworn in. Thank you. Thank you for your time. <clears throat> I just wanted to talk a little bit and give you some information about Casto Development for those of you that aren't familiar with Casto. They're a 94-year-old company that's a third-generation family-run development company out of Columbus, Ohio. They have about 26 million square feet of commercial property in their portfolio and about 5,000 multifamily units in their portfolio. In Florida, they've developed the premier lifestyle shopping center in Lakeland, Lakeside Village Shops, which some of you might be familiar with. In Winter Park, they developed Winter Park Village, which is the premier lifestyle shopping center in Winter Park. Locally, they developed the River, River Club Plaza at the southeast corner of I-75 and Sarah Road 70. They also were able to bring the first Whole Foods to Sarasota, and they developed the Whole Foods project in downtown Sarasota and we developed Main Street in Lakewood Ranch uh, with SMR. Um, last year, we purchased 75 acres in Lakewood Ranch, and we currently have another 25 acres in Manatee County that's under, either under contract or that we currently own. Within about a mile and a half of the Savannah site, we either have under development or under contract 50 acres for plan for development. So um, just west of the site, uh, about a mile and a half, we are developing, we're developing um, at the southeast corner of 64 and 117th. We're doing an ABC Liquor. We're doing a Christian Brothers Automotive, uh, a regional pizza user's coming in, and we sold the back portion to a multifamily user. And just east of here at the corner of Lorraine and 64, we purchased the northeast corner 
um, two months ago. The northwest corner of Lorraine and 64, we have 2.9 usable acres under contract for development. And on the southwest corner, we have 15 acres under contract for future development. So hopefully that uh, is representative of our commitment to Lakewood Ranch, Manatee County, in this corridor. And if approved, we will work with county staff through project design to make sure that we're complying with LDC and make sure that proper mitigation is put in place for potential impacts. Thank you for your time. Very good, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Uh, my name is Ed Vogler. I'm attorney for the applicant, and I have been sworn. Thank you. Uh, these are unusual times and unusual circumstances, and I'm glad the lightning won because I feel like I'm in the penalty box here right now. But nevertheless, uh, we appreciate your kind attention to this matter. Um, that was an excellent presentation by Katie Labar and the commitment that Casto has made to our community. And at this point, this is a prima facie case for approval of this project. Uh, we've worked very closely with your professional staff, and you know they're very good. And when you end up with a staff report that is complete, succinct, straightforward, and positive, recommending approval for your project, you have confidence that the members of the commission and the members of our board of county commissioners will see it likewise. Now, of course, we, we recognize and we respect entirely the comments that are made by members of the public and neighbors, people that drive on State Road 64 and have other interests. This is a developing area of our county. It's developing very nicely, largely residential at this time. It needs support uses. This is plain from the presentation and from the professional staff report and some of the quotations from the report that, that you have read. Now, we recognize that attorneys can represent objecting parties, and there is one that's going to come and speak to you today. And I want you to know that I've read every word that has been written in three or four emails that have been coming to you over the past few days um, that are rather lengthy. And, uh, um, but I've tried to digest each of the comments that are made. And I want uh, to, you to know that I will be actually surprised if some of those comments are presented to you at public hearing. Maybe they will be. We'll see. They've asked for 40 minutes to make a presentation. I think they're going to get 30. But nevertheless, you should listen very carefully because many of the facts, many of the assertions that are going to be made are based upon incorrect facts or a misunderstanding of our code and our plan and our process. So we've reserved time for rebuttal and depending upon what is presented to you in terms of a factual predicate, we will respond to each of those items. But to give you a, a taste and to set uh, the framework for, I hope, what will be probing questions by members of the commission to the speaker. Let me observe a couple of things. The attorney says that this is not a commercial node. That, frankly, is silly. Your staff says it's a commercial node. You have land use operative provisions of the comprehensive plan that say that a commercial node is created at the intersection of two functionally classified roadways. White Eagle Boulevard and State Road 64 are, in fact, functionally classified roadways, collector or higher. And by the way, this was not by happenstance. This was by plan. And I'm speaking now from personal knowledge. Our Eagle Trace project, which is immediately to the west of this, collaborated with SMR and Manatee County to dedicate right-of-way for the realignment of White Eagle Boulevard as it connected to State Road 64. Our Indigo project 
which is a little bit further south down White Eagle, but affected by this project, we spent a year vacating Pope Road and realigning White Eagle Boulevard so that it would provide the access for Lakewood Ranch all the way to State Road 64 at a commercial note. And finally, we collaborated with our uh, friends and, and colleagues at SMR, Lakewood Ranch, in a local development agreement that provided for a joint relationship between SMR and Manatee County to actually build White Eagle Boulevard. So none of this happened by happenstance. The, pro the property immediately to the west of the site under consideration, which is on the hard corner, the southeast corner of White Eagle Boulevard and State Road 64, is owned by SMR. And you know what it's zoned today? Agriculture. I think there's a good chance that SMR will seek an amendment to the code, to the zoning ordinance, the same way we are here today. And so as it relates to commercial node, I think that's, that's silly. I read a lot about site plans. Well, of course we had to have a site plan for this property. There's a pond on this property. And so when you build a pond, you have to present a site plan and you have to present engineering a backup for that lake, for that pond, right? So when you hear the gentleman talk about site plan and all oh, the residents relied upon the site plan, I want you to know this. The site plan itself expired February 20, 2019. It's expired. So anything you hear about site plan is entirely a red herring and unrelated to anything that we're talking about here. You're going to hear also some testimony, I guess, about private deed restrictions. Now, I've, I've been doing this a long time, and I, I don't speak for the county attorney's office, but I think you'll be told that private deed restrictions are not proper subject of a zoning hearing. And that makes good sense because private parties can change their restrictions. Now, in fact, there is a restriction that this particular property that we're talking about now, SMR has restricted it so that the obnoxious uses that you could describe would not be allowed on this site. SMR has regarded as having the one or number two best master planned communities in the entire country. And it's hard to imagine that they would collaborate with us on something that would impair that vision that they've worked so hard on. So I'll have more to say about these private restrictions in the event it's, it's mentioned um, in, in the comments, and I'll be surprised if it is. But nevertheless, the final point, we all worry about floodplain and flooding. And so what I read in the commentary that's been presented to you is that we really shouldn't trust the Stantec modeling, Stantec being a private company, because Stantec also represents the applicant. So what's the implication there? That the engineer is going to fudge it so that we can get a five-acre parcel rezoned? This is offensive, okay? It's offensive, but there's more. And you'll ask your engineers and your county support because there is a letter of map amendment that has been become effective in April of 2020. And it modeled all of the floodplain and it changed the maps, right? And who did the modeling? Stantec. And in collaboration with Swift Mud, Swift Mud and Manatee County have accepted that modeling because Swift Mud didn't complete theirs. So just think about the level of review that has been provided, both from the transportation side, the zoning side, land use, neighborhood interconnectivity. Ask yourself all these questions, as you will, and as you deliberate. But please, please, ask the gentleman these questions as well because we don't get to cross-examine him. So I'm going to pause for now and resume again 
uh, at the time of, that, of our rebuttal, and I want to thank you very much for your kind attention to this matter. Very good. Thank you. Does that conclude the applicant presentation? Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, we're going to go ahead and go to um, staff presentation, but just the point of uh, housekeeping, uh, as soon as we uh, complete staff presentation, we're going to go ahead and break for lunch. We'll take an, a one hour break and then resume and uh, open it up for questions to the applicant or the or staff. And then uh, subsequent to that, we'll open it up for uh, public comment. So, so Ms. Rainey, good morning. S still morning. Dorothy Rainey for staff, and I have been sworn. Thank you. And I have pretty brief presentations, and I will just do the one after the other back to back. And then, like you said, we'll break for lunch. Um, so the first one, I, uh, item five, is Meritage Homes. The request being... Uh, to reduce the acreage of the project by the 5.23 acre parcel that the applicant mentioned that will be uh, considered for rezoning to general commercial. The 5.23 acres um, okay, will be rezoned. Um, the future land use category is UF3, as you can see there, as is most of the surrounding property. The zoning is plan development residential, as the Savannah, uh, overall Savannah project is zoned. Uh, the aerial photos are right there. Um, so the site information, again, it's going to be one parcel of 299.16 acres once the 5.23 acres are removed. It's zoned plan development residential in the urban fringe three future land use category. The access points are through um, Savannah Palm Court to State Road 64 and then also onto Lorraine Road on the east end of the project. Surrounding uses uh, to the north across State Road 64 is the Mill Creek Subdivision Zone PDR, uh, the Rye Road Office Park Zone Plan Development Office, and Rye Road Medical Park Zone Plan Development Mixed Use. To the south is Vacant Land Zone A, recently approved Indigo Subdivision Zone PDR, and the Northwest Sector DRI, which is zone PDMU. To the east is the approved FDOT Operations Center Zone Plan Development Public Interest, Agricultural and Single Family Residential Uses Zone A, approved commercial, park, approved commercial Park and Existing Commercial Uses along Lorraine Road, and also Zone PDC. And to the west, we have Vacant Land Zone A, approved subdivisions Serenity Creek and Eagle Trace, and the recently approved Indigo, all zone PDR. <clears throat> the project, again, was rezoned to PDR and is being developed as single-family residential with a gross density of 1.59 dwelling units per acre and net density of 2.26 dwelling units per acre. So the positive aspects are there are no changes to the previously approved preliminary site plan with the exception of the overall acreage, open space, and residential density for the project. The 5.23 acre parcel being removed from the originally approved project is more appropriate for non-residential development as it is located within a commercial node, as we mentioned. Uh, the open space for the original project was already over the minimum required and remains so with the removal of the 5.23 acre parcel. And the density approved for the original project is still within what is allowed for the development. The negative aspects, we don't see any apparent or notable negative impacts. And there's no need for mitigating measures as a result. And we recommend approval of the amendment to the preliminary site plan with the stipulations, the existing stipulations. Thank you. And then we'll go ahead and go on to the next one. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. So the next one, of course, is the 5.23 acre parcel that's coming from the previous project. Um, the request is to rezone the 5.23 acres from PDR, Plan Development Residential, to General Commercial. It's also within, obviously, the UF3 feature land use, Urban French 3, and it's currently in the PDR zoning. Um, there's aerials of the site. 
Um, the, it's one, uh, one parcel of 5.23 acres. Again, zone PDR, UF3 future land use category. And the access point would be off of Savannah Palm Court to State Road 64. Surrounding uses to the north is vacant land zoned agri agricultural, general agriculture. To the south is residential development and open space from Savannah, of Savannah, um, zone PDR. To the east is um, State Road 64 and then Mill Creek subdivision across to the east, zone PDR. And to the west is residential development in the Savannah and the road right of way uh, for the Prairie View uh, Boulevard, Prairie View Court, I believe, um, zone PDR. Um, general commercial uses that may be allowed for consideration when, if this is to be rezoned um, are in Table 4 3 um, uses in non residential districts, and it includes commercial and retail uses and services, as the uh, applicant indicated would be likely developed on the site. Um, I also have a um, comparison chart that was included in the staff report uh, packet. Um, comparing what's allowed in PDR versus general commercial. The intensity allowable is um, 0.35 or the floor area ratio, 0.35 or 0.5, depending on if you categorize it as a commercial node versus activity node. Floor area ratio is dictated by the urban fringe three feature land use category. The density is allowed at three dwelling units per acre in the UF3. Maximum project size is likely to be medium, 150,000 square feet, or whatever the floor area ratio limits uh, the project to, the lesser of the two, of course. Positive aspects, the site is within a commercial node and it complies with the commercial locational criteria. Thus, it's eligible to be considered for commercial retail development. And the location of the site may be cons considered more appropriate for non-residential development as it abuts State Road 64. The negatives, general commercial zoning, will introduce the potential for commercial uses near residential uses, which may come with additional light and noise impacts. <clears throat> and then the uh, mitigating measures, of course, the Land Development Code provides standards for specific uses that may have negative externalities and has requirements for additional landscaping and buffering for certain commercial uses next to residential uses. Mitigation measures will be administratively reviewed at time of the submittal of a final site plan for the project. Staff recommends approval of the request for the rezone from plan development residential to general commercial. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything additional for from staff? Oh, oh I'm sorry. Um, I, I had handed out um, additional public comment that came after the finalizing of the uh, update memo. There's a single sheet um, that came separately and then the, uh, uh, multiple sheets that were stapled together. Those are all public comment for the pro for really for the both projects. <laughs> okay, very good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and again, is there anything additional from staff, stormwater transportation, <coughs> anything to add at the moment, Mr. Gerstenberger? Uh, Mr. Chair, fellow commissioners, um, I'm sure you're aware there was some public comment with regards to uh, the floodplain uh, for the rezone parcel uh, application. Um, as was alluded to during the uh, opening presentation by the applicant, um, there has been <clears throat> a uh, letter of map revision that was uh, submitted and that was approved sub subsequently by FEMA. Um, that was approved back in <coughs> April 8th of 2019. It, it did uh, modify both 100-year floodplain delineation, uh, the 100-year flood, floodway, and base flood elevation associated with this particular watershed in this area, which happens to be Mill Creek. Um, with respect to the rezone parcel itself, uh, concerning this is a rezone application, there are no staff recommendations of, uh, storm, of uh, stormwater conditions since uh, rezone application uh, does not carry uh, stipulations in the staff report. However, at subsequent time of a final site plan and a construction plan submittal, the applicant would be required to address uh, the stormwater requirements associated with this watershed, which would include the uh, a, a 50% reduction in the allowable pre-development rate of runoff, and also to address floodplain mitigation for any impacts 
associated with the 100-year floodplain delineation pursuant to the letter of map revision. I would also note that there is, a, there is an ongoing uh, watershed management plan for Mill Creek um, that has not been finalized. Um, it is uh, nearing, the, nearing completion, however, that particular watershed study uh, has not been completed and has not been approved uh, by Southwest Florida Water Management District. Um, however, uh, staff has coordinated with the applicant and the applicant is, uh, is to utilize the letter of map revision uh, with respect to the 100-year floodplain delineation. Uh, for the uh, rezone application, and as I stated earlier, the subsequent final site plan and construction plan submittals. Thank you, Mr. Gerstenberger. Uh, I, I don't know that I heard you say what the, the uh, what the designation of this parcel is currently based on the letter of map. Actually, revision. I can bring it up. Right. Please. First off, thank you, Natalie, for, for bringing this up. Uh, Excuse me. The, uh, I probably haven't done this already, and I probably should. Uh, for this particular project, Thomas Gersenberg, Public Works Department, I have been sworn. Thank you. Um, for this particular rezone parcel application area, which is the area I'm circling here, you'll denote that the uh, southeastern or the eastern portion of this prod, uh, parcel is showed in an, and shown in an orange shade, whereas the northwest portion of this particular parcel is located within a blue shade. Uh, what you'll see on this map is you'll see uh, zone delineation um, called, at, called out as AE. Um, now, per flood insurance rate maps, zone AEs are areas that are within 100-year floodplain delineation and also include uh, subsequently include a uh, established base flood elevation. And what you'll see from this map is that there are lines, there are cross sections, cross sections essentially, which are also drawn on this map, which identify the base flood elevation um, based upon the lay of the land and also the contours associated with the, um, the channel itself with Mill Creek. So what you'll see is there is a slice or there is a cross section of uh, 25.4 um, that essentially bisects uh, Prairie View Drive and then runs through the existing stormwater detention facility at elevation 25.4 and then subsequently further to the north um, you'll see another line at 24.7. So with respect to this particular parcel the base flood elevation will vary from 25.4 to 24.7. At time of um, subsequent final site plan construction plan submittals, um, the applicant will be required to address floodplain mitigation based upon those base flood elevations and with respect to the existing site topography. Um, if, should there be any 100-year floodplain impacts that are identified um, pursuant to the base flood elevation, then um, Compensatory floodplain storage would be required for impacts within the 100-year floodplain. Very good. Thank you. All right. Anything further from staff? Yes, sir. Mr. Galeano. Um, okay. Nelson Galeano, Transportation Planning. Um, I, I, I want to recall that uh, this is a reason and we don't have detailed analysis at access points. It will be at the final site plan stage. Um, let me also... Uh, uh, clarify some issues. Uh, sometimes transportation planning goes also with land use planning. Um, and I want to use uh, the, an example of um, US 41 to clarify what happened here. Uh, initially, US 41 was a, a connection between Sarasota and Bradenton. It was for design initially at the beginning for long trips. Uh, but the roadway uh, evolved in the same way that the land use evolved. 
and, and for that reason, uh, we start performing activities along the US 41. It means go, we go shopping, recreation, we go to the doctor, lawyers, any, any, anything. Uh, and, and, and the character of the US 41 change. The same will happen with the uh, State Road 64. Right now, we have a, a resident, rural, uh, it's undefined, saying that way, uh, the character of the roadway, of the State Road 64, Manatee Avenue. Um, in other words, uh, we expect the transformation on the State Road 64. And, and the beauty of this is that uh, um, Florida Department of Transportation is aware of this change. In, that, in, in this context, they put two traffic uh, round, two roundabouts along Manatee Avenue. Uh, and that is a good thing because uh, they, are, they are aware of the future transformation. Um, it's helping right now this, um, the, the FDOT District 1 and the implementation of this roundabout uh, help us to speak about connectivity and accessibility along the corridor. It means the, in the future, State Road 64 will be an activity corridor like uh, Right now is US 41. Be, be aware of this condition. What, what happened with this? Um, we perform our activities along the corridors uh, because we have different, we have Euclidean zones, we have residential areas. Uh, we need to travel where we perform the activities from our houses, our residential areas. If we don't have a viability, the, uh, diversity of land uses, our trips are longer. It means uh, uh, if we want to chop something and the chopping possibility is far away, our trip is longer. Um, uh, and, we, and we test this thing, this relationship between non-residential and residential uh, by means of a ratio. Uh, right now we perform some calculations uh, along along White Eagle, and, and the relationship between uh, non-residential to residential, it means how many trips are non-residential trips with respect to residential trips. Right now we have 1.11. Uh, if um, we eliminate, if the land, if the trips, uh, non-residential trips uh, will be eliminated, uh, we lost six percent about uh, on this ratio. It means the higher the ratio, the long, the shorter the trips, and for that reason, the less congestion. I, I hope you understand my point. Uh, uh, and that is important when we see this type of uh, uh, non-residential projects uh, 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 in the county, because uh, a healthy development uh, requires a balance between residential and non-residential. Very good. Thank you. All right. Um, as I mentioned previously, we're going to go ahead and take a break for lunch and then come back. We'll open it up for questions uh, to staff. Um, I would like to remind the commissioners not to discuss this application during lunch. Uh, let's make sure all discussions, comments, or uh, conversations are on the record. So, uh, again, we're going to go ahead and break and, uh, again, resume at 1 o'clock. So, meeting is, a, is a, in recess.
believe we had just heard from staff presentations, uh, staff presentation, um, and uh, we had heard from the applicant. So, um, for uh, the commissioners, are there any questions for staff uh, prior to get opening it up for? Um, Public comment. Yeah, I have one real quick. Let me bring it back up real quick. Yes, Mr. Sorry. Ron. <clears throat> hey, Ms. Rainey, how are you? Did <laughs> I catch you at a bad time? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, my one question is, is, do we have any idea how far the closest residence is to this parcel hmm. beyond the stormwater management area or the pond? <laughs> I thought the applicant had mentioned the distance. I don't specifically. I didn't, I didn't hear that, so maybe maybe the applicant can okay. respond to that in a minute. Okay. Was it 600 feet? That's we'll, what uh, I thought, 600, yeah. That's 600? Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll uh, ask the applicant to, okay. to verify that one. Uh, all right, thank you. So That's it. Um, all right. Um, I did have a question for uh, Mr. Gerstenberger. Um, the graphic you showed, we had a blue area, I believe, identified as AE. And then the orange area, what was the orange area that was the designation? <clears throat> Mr. Chair, sorry, I forgot to mention that the uh, orange area would be areas outside of the 100-year floodplain. Um, typically, those areas outside of the 100-year floodplain that are still shaded are those areas that might be uh, subject to inundation from a 500-year storm event. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you. All right. Any ad additional <clears throat> questions for staff? Mr. Uh, Rutledge, yes. Uh, do you think that the uh, design of the property, whatever ultimately becomes of it, that it will argue some other access, or is it over? Is it within a thousand feet that they can have some other access onto the property, other than the back side of it? Um, the uh, well, it, it definitely cannot have one off sixty-four. <laughs> okay, that that was so, my question. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Nelson can probably elaborate on that. <laughs> and uh, also, let's uh, be uh, mindful that we need, still need to say that we're on the record uh, that you have been sworn. So. Oh, I'm sorry. Do I need to do that? Sure. Why not? Okay. <laughs> I have been sworn. Thank Dorothy you. Dorothy Rain with staff. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, some road questions? Sure. Uh, is it for staff or for the applicant? Let's do it with staff. Okay. All right. So Please. there is a roundabout on 64, is there not? Is there one on at Lorraine? We're going to be one at Lorraine? Yes? White, White Eagle. White Eagle. At White Eagle. Okay. And is that in front I'm, of... I'm sorry. Okay. So that is closest to Rye Road? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. And is there going to be a stoplight on 64 anywhere? Excuse like me. at Lorraine? And there are another is uh, right about, and I, I don't recall exactly. There is a light, uh, there is a light at Lorraine. <laughs> okay. Does anybody else know besides me that there's a 15-acre shopping center planned at the corner of Lorraine and 64 on the south west side? You do, because Castro has it. <laughs> no. Okay, I'm just talking about how much traffic is going to be involved if you haven't caught the drift. Thank you. All right. Uh, anything further? So, okay. All right. All right. Um, with that, we're going to go ahead and go to the public comment portion of the hearing. I've got a couple speaker cards, and as uh, Ms. Shank uh, had um, stated before, we'll allow extra time for uh, Mr. Lobeck, and um, since he's requested it, uh, hopefully I didn't lose a um, speaker card here. I thought I had four, but I only got three. But uh, again, we'll give anybody the opportunity to speak who wishes to. So um, the uh, first speaker card I have is uh, Israel Artagina. And again, um, you requested additional time. You provided documentation, so um, you'll be granted 10 minutes um, time, please. Thank you. Okay. All right. How are you guys doing? Uh, it's, uh, so my name is uh, Israel Arteaga. It was a, it was a good effort, <laughs> chairperson, good effort. Yeah, 90% <laughs> of the time I'll get it wrong, so. 
Um, and before my time starts, if I could just ask a favor, if, uh, you know, during the meeting, if a fly happens to come in <laughs> and land on my hair, can you please stop the meeting and allow me to, uh, to remove the fly? <laughs> exactly. Hysterically at you. Exactly. So uh, I have two presentations for you. So I'll have a, uh, from a community uh, PowerPoint. So if we could uh, cue the PowerPoint, uh, Natalie. Um, and then I will have my, my own personal statement um, following these, these comments as well. So obviously, uh, as expected, you know, um, as I put on the card, obviously, uh, uh, an opposition presentation here. So we'll move to page two. So uh, in regards to the application to the remove uh, the 5.2 acres of open space from the approved site uh, development plan at, at Savannah at Lakewood Ranch, uh, you know, obviously the community um, is asking that this be denied um, on all points, both, both uh, both applications in front of you today. So the homeowners in Savannah that purchased single family homes had a right to rely on the recorded restrictions from Lakewood Ranch, which prohibited commercial development on the property. <laughs> Many of the affected owners have purchased prior to the uh, deed restriction modification that occurred in March, according to what we can see on the, um, on the Manatee website. Um, next page, so again, similar, just obviously the first one showing a, a zoning plan of the, the property. The second one showing a, a satellite uh, view of it. And again, similar statement here, uh, you know, we feel this should be denied. You know, we purchased uh, single family homes and we had a right to rely on the recorded restrictions that are uh, uh, with, the, with the county um, from Lakewood Ranch uh, as well, which prohibited commercial development on the property as it was identified as, as open space. Um, and again, uh, several affected owners here um, as well. Next slide. Just a, a shot of, you know, just a sampling of some of the affected owners um, on here. So obviously hundreds more um, that we can provide as well to the list. And then on the on the next page, um, just some some visual pictures for you guys. So the picture on the left is 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 actually taken from the the bus stop, which is a a huge concern for us, um, which I'll get into a little further. Um, and then the, the second picture is the newly developed uh, Prairie View Drive uh, road, which sits to the, the left of the first picture. So that intersection that you're looking at on the left side, so this, this road here is called Savannah Palms Court for reference. And then the, the, the street in the second picture is Prairie View Drive. So just some, you can see beautiful open, open space here as, as was approved by the, uh, this board in 2014. Uh, next page is, is the main entrance, so this, uh, this visual here, um, obviously to the left of the photograph is uh, State Road 64 looking east, um, which currently only provides, as you can see in the, the, the left there in the top corner, is a, is a left turn access lane onto uh, Savannah Palms Court, which is our community's private main entrance uh, to our residential homes. So, you know, there's, you know, not sure the difference and would be speaking out of place if I said I understood the difference between you know, developing a, a residential road and a commercial road for um, a, a larger amount of traffic. But I would have to uh, make the assessment that this was built for residential capacity and not for commercial capacity. And just a, a, another reference is that this is um, a private road and it's maintained um, by the Home Association of Savannah. The next page is our uh, school bus picture stops, so some pictures of, a, of, a, of an active drop happening uh, by the Manatee School District um, or some other area of school here. So as you can see, this is uh, the first picture um, on the left of the screen is, is actually from the pickup spot of the buses. So the bus comes through Savannah Palms Court, makes a U-turn at the roundabout, and then picks up uh, the students. Currently, we have about 75 kids that are utilizing this bus stop uh, today, obviously. <laughs> The, the circumstance surrounding, uh, you know, the, the world right now with COVID, uh, this will only increase um, as, as the kids start to return to school um, in the second and third quarters of, uh, of classes, as well as the development. It's not finished yet. So there's still, my understanding, a little over 100 homes uh, left to be developed by Meritage, which, um, you know, currently, obviously, this is a very family-friendly community with tons of kids. Next page. And again, just an additional um, 
picture of the bus stop. So you can see, so the pickup handles on the other side, the drop off handles on this side. So just envision, you know, 75 kids being dropped off or picked up by the school bus, the amount of cars that that already brings with the parents dropping them off, the kids riding school bikes, um, golf carts from the community, obviously um, going there to pick up and drop off the kids. So you can see this happens on both sides of the street here. So obviously any any kind of increase of commercial traffic or utilization of, of Savannah Palms Court for um, a commercial traffic will, will obviously disrupt and, and continue to increase the congestion that currently happens just from the neighborhood itself. Next uh, page is just some points that we've highlighted from the community um, of concern for us. So I'm not going to read them all. You guys have this in front of you. It'll be uh, included in the, the record here. Um, I will highlight a few. So obviously no, no other subdivision in Lakewood Ranch has a strip mall right outside its main entrance gate or any kind of retail right outside its main entrance gate. So, you know, personally speaking, I, I moved here uh, three years ago. That was one of the, uh, the main attributes that I liked about the Lakewood Ranch. I could have obviously chose to live in West Bradenton. I could have chose to live um, in other towns and communities around here, but I, I liked and it was definitely sold on the idea of what Lakewood Ranch was being uh, created as. Um, approvable, approval of this would, would just set a bad precedent, right? That um, essentially allowing commercial development to be integrated into the, the main entrance of a residential development is very concerning, and it should be concerning for, um, for all parties involved here. Um, this is a family development, and you know having commercial integrated into the main entrance is, uh, is not good. And it's a, in our opinion, it's a bad precedent to set. Um, obviously highlighting the point that was brought up that this was designated as open space in the, in the 2014 um, site plan. And then just in general, I mean, it, it, I don't know of anybody that would like to have a, a big box store um, integrated into their, their main entrance of the community and, and have their private roads utilized for commercial traffic. So. Um, you know, we were under the impression of 79,000 square feet, um, but obviously the, in the staff prepared remarks, it showed that it could go up to 150,000 square feet. So maybe some clarification there, but I'm, you know, obviously highlight this point even more that 150,000 square feet of retail space and the traffic that it will bring. And obviously Lakewood Ranch is only halfway developed, right? We're the, we're the West Lakewood Ranch currently where we sit, and there's still a whole East Lakewood Ranch yet to be uh, built in the northern uh, part of Lakewood Ranch. Next page. So um, again, if we haven't said it enough, increased traffic impact impacting the main entrance gate of Savannah at Lakewood Ranch. Um, developers traffic study that we've seen calculates 460 new vehicle trips during the busiest hour afternoon. You know, I, I think that's a, a tough study to look at right now, right? Just given the, the circumstance around coronavirus and the impact that's had on our community and communities around the US. I think that number is probably double to say um, of, of traffic. And, and again, that's only with this part of Lakewood Ranch already completed and still, um, I know currently over, I think over 5,000 homes approved west of, or sorry, east of Lorraine Road uh, to be developed, <clears throat> if not more. That's just what I'm aware of. Um, and again, traffic impact on, on, on the residential, uh, on the residents of, of Savannah, again, What's stopping, you know, there, there's no plan to stop the commercial traffic, especially from coming from the east on State Road 64 and turning left onto uh, Savannah Palms Court to get into the commercial development. So, and then lastly, just the, you know, obviously with any commercial development comes, um, you know, light, noise pollution, as well as other, other types of, you know, increased trash, increased garbage, um, just, Several, several things. Uh, next page, so just, you know, you'll hear from our, um, from Dan a little bit more on this, but, but obviously it's, from, from what we can see, this is uh, inside the, uh, the floodplain, and it, and it looks like it continues to be inside the floodplain, the majority of the property outside of the, the lake that currently exists um, on the property, so. And then the, the last page, um, sorry, I'm two pages ahead now. So the last page, uh, just again, some, some additional families, um, concerned families obviously opposing 
the removing of the 5.23 acres. So that concludes the, uh, the group portion of uh, the PowerPoint. I'll move into my own, my own comments at this time. Uh, so Chairperson, Planning Commission, thank you. Thank you for your time. I'm here to offer my comments uh, as a homeowner to the commission regarding the site plan amendment and rezoning known as Savannah Commercial, which is up for discussion today. Me and my family have resided at Lakewood Ranch, at the Savannah at Lakewood Ranch community since May of 2018. And we've come to enjoy the relaxing and open recreational space that Lakewood Ranch and East Manatee offers its residents. My concern with the proposal before the board is the aesthetic change to the Savannah community traffic and safety that commercial development brings, and the commercial use of private roads. So the first point is the aesthetic change to our community. The current aesthetic of the community entrance will be severely changed and impacted by the addition of large retail development integrated into our front door. While aesthetics are generally subjective, I do believe that it was not the intention of the Planning Commission when approving this development in 2014 to integrate a commercial development as part of our community entrance. No community in Lakewood Ranch that I have found or am aware of has had a commercial development directly integrated into the entrance of their community. Essentially, a big box retail development will become our new front door. My second point is regarding traffic and safety. As a resident, personally, I frequently utilize the main community entrance and sidewalks on State Road 64 for bike rides and walks with my family, my son and my daughter. You know, removal of this 5.23 acres of open space for recreational use from our community for commercial use will create increased traffic on our private roads. That's Prairie View Drive and Savannah Palms Court, which is a cause for concern and will make residents of the community think twice about utilizing these open recreational spaces for bike rides or any other vehicular activity. Our children in the community, as I mentioned earlier, utilize this main community entrance as a school bus stop for pickup and drop off to area schools. The increased traffic caused by removing this open space and developing it will create more safety issues as more congestion, more cars will be utilizing this road. And additionally, as I mentioned earlier, the, the most efficient way to access this 5.23 acres proposal and application of this development is from the eastbound State Road 64. It's to turn left onto Savannah Palms Court. That's a private road and, and by the way, our private community entrance, which leads me to my next concern. Prairie View Drive and Savannah Palms Court are private roads, which are maintained by the community of Savannah, homeowners. It's in our budget, our HOA budget. Removing these 5.23 acres from our community for commercial development will place an additional financial burden in the form of increased homeowners association dues on the homeowners of this community. It is my understanding that while Meritage Homes is requesting to remove and sell this 5.23 acres from the Savannah community, the 5.23 acres will remain part of the Savannah Homeowners Association. This means that as a homeowner, not today, and not while Meritage is in control of the development, <clears throat> excuse me, of this community, but after they leave, I will be paying increased amounts for the maintenance of commercial common areas and increased road use of this proposed commercial development. As the continued development of East Manatee County and Lakewood Ranch continue eastward, traffic into this proposed commercial area will only continue to increase. When I purchased my home in the community in 2018, the HOA fee was top of mind and I have zero interest of having a commercial property in our HOA. So the final thoughts for me is the aesthetics of our main entrance. We're changing our, our, our private residential entrance and integrating commercial into the community's entrance. Safety for our kids, the increased commercial traffic, and the use of uh, private roads creating an additional financial burden to the homeowners so with that, the Savannah removal and rezone request is, in my mind, in my opinion, an inadequate proposal. I ask the committee to deny this proposal, both of them, and it's in their entirety, and as the impact it will have uh, on the quality of life for the Savannah community is serious, unwanted, and not necessary. Again, thank you, Chairperson and the Commission, for your time today and allowing us as residents to, to voice our concern.
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Can I, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Excuse me. Thank you. Excuse me, sir. Uh, yes. One second. You had brought up that you had bought this property under a deed restriction that said this would always maintain as a green open space or something like that in your deed restrictions, correct? That's correct. Yeah, we, we and, asked about the, the main entrance. And then, and then you said they changed them in March of this year, correct? That's our understanding, again. Well, I'm just for my own information, were you, did SMR or Lakewood Ranch notify you guys of the DD restriction change that they were going to, that they had moved this property? From? I, did, I did not receive any notification. The only notification I received was of the um, aforementioned community meeting um, from this group, which was held on September 9th. And I recently just received uh, two letters in the mail um, regarding this, this meeting today. And that, that's the only... Uh, notification I have received on, on any changes. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, the uh, next speaker card I have is Mary Campbell. Um, if you would come forward, again, state your name and that you have been sworn, and uh, you'll, you'll have three minutes. My name is Mary Campbell. I'm a resident of Savannah. Uh, if you noticed on the slide that they had presented, they said the nearest homeowners were 600 feet. I don't know for sure if that's true, but you were pointing at my house. So I'm one of the nearest neighbors, and we are very concerned. We moved here to be our forever home. We had hoped that we wouldn't have to move again. We don't know now. We're concerned about property values. We're concerned about noise. Uh, we're close enough to State Road 64 where I am that I can hear noise from 64. I can certainly hear ambulances go by. I can hear traffic go by. When they go past the roundabout, they get so excited that they can go 55 and 60 again that they take off and make a lot of noise. I'm also extremely concerned about the school children that are at the bus stop. Uh, I see them sometimes when I come back from grocery shopping or something and they're getting off the bus. And there are an awful lot of kids and they're everywhere. Some of them walk home because it's a safe neighborhood. Uh, but kids are kids and they don't pay attention to what's going on around them. If they're excited about a grade they got in school or something, they're going to run for it. So it, it really concerns me about that. Uh, I'm very concerned about noise pollution, light pollution because my, my home backs up to this commercial thing. Whatever it's gonna be, I'm also concerned about what it's gonna be. And I'm, I'm concerned because commercial uh, zoning is, is pretty broad. And there's an awful lot of things that can go in there. And it can be an empty building for a while. If uh, the economy doesn't turn around, the building could stay empty. That could increase crime in the area. Um, and it's right outside our neighborhood. And it, it really isn't a good look at all. And uh, we moved in under the understanding, and we, were, we moved in in October of 2019, uh, and we understood that that was going to stay open spaces forever. And we've been blindsided by this. And I can tell you that there would be an awful lot more homeowners here if this meeting was held at 7 o'clock at night instead of 9 o'clock in the morning. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I don't have any other speaker cards other than Mr. Lobeck, and Mr. Lobeck's requested additional time. So in, uh, prior to asking Mr. Lobeck to come up, I'd ask if there's anybody else in the audience who wishes to come forward and make a statement. You have to actually come up. <laughs> and uh, if you could, please state your name and that you have been sworn. Hi, I'm Britt Elwell, and I have not been sworn. No, I was afraid of that. No, <laughs> no, no worries. Um, again, if there's anybody else in the audience who wishes to speak on any application uh, to be heard, include this one or the uh, the remaining ones, please rise to be sworn in. If you don't do it now, you'll have to do it later. Or affirm that the factual statements and factual representations which you're about to present to the Planning Commission will be truthful and accurate. I do. <laughs> Thank you. And you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. I'd also like to request additional time in the interest of due process. Denied. Okay. 
you have to provide documentation prior to the meeting. So. Okay, thought I'd ask anyways. <laughs> There's no reason to filibuster on this. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman, commissioners. You've heard your fellow commissioner argue that this development will decrease congestion along State Road 64. He also suggested it will aid in transforming State Road 64 into a commercial corridor and equated it to US 41. We pay significant CDD fees to Lakewood Ranch in exchange for a quality of life not found along Tamiami Trail. When I purchased my home in November of 2018, this entrance was and continues to be zoned open residential space. It was landscaped to mirror the pond on the opposite side of our entrance to attract buyers by Meritage Homes. This is a classic bait and switch. Today you'll hear from other concerned Savannah homeowners and our attorney. They'll touch on zoning restrictions and floodplain maps, traffic patterns and home values. I'd like to express my concerns as a mother with young children utilizing the bus stop at the intersection of Savannah Palms Court and Prairie View Drive on a daily basis. I purchased my home in Savannah at Lakewood Ranch in 2018, having moved from Maryland, seeking a safe enclave in which to rear my children. A unique feature of our community is the number of multi-generational family homes in our neighborhood. Many homes have separate entrances for in-law suites with attached garages so grandparents can live alongside the family to help care for their children. Others, like me, have parents who purchase their own home within the community. As such, we have many families with grandparents who assist working parents with childcare. On my street alone, I can count eight families who are multi-generational. I'm a single working mom with six and nine-year-old daughters who attend Gullet Elementary in Lakewood Ranch. My mom and dad are in their 70s and they take my girls to and from the school bus on their golf cart each day along with countless other parents and grandparents. Many kids ride their bikes home alone because they don't have anyone there to help out. We had to add extra bike racks last year and our neighborhood is only halfway built out. We fill an entire bus, three seats across, well that was prior to COVID, um, but even now it's, it's a about 45 kids to 75 kids, and that's just the elementary school. Middle and high school students walk to their buses at dawn. If you allow this rezoning, our children will no longer be able to safely walk to and from the bus, along with the traffic hazard of 460 cars per hour at peak times, you're also introducing a commercial element to a residential neighborhood, which means our county is giving the stamp of approval for strangers in close proximity to our children each and every day. And that map that they showed as far as where the bus stop was, that doesn't show the way it loops around where all the parents park along one side and they run across the grass and the bus driver, it's a helper I guess, the bus driver's there, the bus driver hops off and then has to usher the kids across the grass right in front of Prairie View Drive. These cars are, and semi-trucks traveling around State Route 64 would not be allowed in the school pickup lines in Manatee County, yet they'll be allowed within yards of our children's bus stop. Meritage is attempting to level our front entrance, fill in our pond, and open space, and to access our private road to our gated community. No other community in Lakewood Ranch has been subjected to acquiescing their front entrance to big box development. The county is putting a developer's profits ahead of their constituent safety. This decision would set a precedent for communities along State Road 64, State Road 70, and University, and change the appeal of Lakewood Ranch for decades to come. I urge you to think about the safety of Manatee County's children and seniors today and deny this application. Thank right. you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. And again, uh, I have no more speaker cards. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak on this application? Okay, please come forward. And then Mr. Lobeck, you'll have 30 minutes after that. Good afternoon. My name is Ellen Smith. And I have a little and, different perspective. And you've been yes. sworn? Yes, I have. Very good. Thank you. I have a little bit different perspective of things. Um, we moved here around a year and a half ago, and I moved from after having lived in Maui, Hawaii, for 30-something years. 
So I thought that this was the little piece of paradise that we had found in Sarasota, and I was so excited after my mother had spent 30-something years in West Palm Beach, and I thought, not my thing. I'd rather live on this side, and it's beautiful in the Gulf of Mexico. But six weeks ago, when I found that this was going to happen to our area, my jaw dropped. And, um, thank you. and I just found myself reflecting on how things change and what happens to an area. And it happened to Maui. And I watched the beauty of Maui over the 30 years and the past few years really begin to get developed. Um, traffic is just... It's just unbelievable, the bottlenecking that happens, the infrastructure can't meet the demand, etc. And the grave concern of, once again, crime going up, even in that <coughs> panacea, it happened. And so our gravest concern is, of course, as everyone had said before, and our concern is with the children. I'm also very concerned about the aesthetics of the area. And I ask those that are applauding one another for having purchased this beautiful piece of property in Lakewood Ranch to just consider the effect that it had in the community because a lot of us didn't know that this was going to happen. And one of the reasons why I moved from Maui is because I saw the writing on the wall. And I'm hoping that you're well aware of the fact that these things can change if the building is not aesthetically pleasing, if you're building Costco's and everything else. It's very frightening what can happen to it. I've lived it, and I don't want that to happen to this area again. So thank you very much. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And again, is there anybody else who wishes to come forward? No. Uh, I think the, uh, for the record, the, uh, uh, you're going to make me say your name again. <laughs> Mr. R. Tiga uh, has indicated that he was sworn in for the record if he didn't state that previously. So I think we did, but just for the record. All right. Is there anybody else who wishes to come forward that hasn't provided a speaker card? Okay. Mr. Loback, uh, you're next. And as I mentioned previously, you have 30 minutes. So thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, uh, honorable commissioners. My name is Dan Lobeck, uh, board certified in condominium and plan development law, uh, practicing for 40 years, uh, law firm of Lobeck and Hanson. And I'm, I'm proud today to represent the Savannah Homeowners Committee that has broad support among the hundreds of resident homeowners in the subdivision that would be so severely impacted in an adverse way if you approve these ill-advised land use changes that are before you. And you know, Mr. Vogler's a very good land use attorney. You see him all the time for developers. Uh, but honestly, I have to take a little bit of offense for my clients, for him to suggest that their concerns are silly and, and that the, the grounds that we put forward in opposition, clear, well-founded opposition from standpoints of fact and law, are silly. Uh, tends to be overreaching sometimes in his characterization of, uh, of the, the neighborhood concerns. Our concerns are such, frankly, that this is a no-brainer and in terms of, of needing to be denied. The developer certainly has no entitlement legally to take this planned development residential parcel, steal it from the subdivision, and I'll, I'll lay the predicate for that, and then rezone it from residential to general commercial, the most intense kind of commercial you can contemplate for the type of use that, that might go on onto this property. Now, I want to show you a graphic from the site plan for Savannah. This is in the record of the planning department from the pre-application review. And they observe in there that this is part of the site plan, which you're being asked to amend today. And that is designated as passive recreation open space for the homeowners in Savannah. That highlighting is by staff. So this is just not some stranded parcel somewhere that the developer has the right to do what he wants to with it. This was sold to the people of Savannah as their 
passive recreation open space. And I've got another copy that I've put into the record. Mr. Vogler says, well, just disregard that. The site plan has expired. Well, I ask you a pretty cogent question here today. If the site plan has expired, why are you being asked to amend it? In, in fact, it does still exist. Because Mr. Vogler didn't tell you about a state statute 252.363 that says when the governor issues a state of emergency, parcels or, or development orders such as this site plan are uh, subject to being extended. And the most recent of those applicable orders was in August of this year. And frankly, if the Savannah site plan, preliminary site plan, final site plan, whatever you want to call it, has expired, why is this developer, Meritage Homes, now actively building phase four? the final 100 plus homes that are allowed to be developed under this site plan. So that, that's nonsense. The site plan is there and that's why you're being asked to amend it, to carve out this parcel. Now this parcel, if you saw from some of the pictures, uh, you know, I gave you something on Google Earth if anybody saw my emails, but that's old. This is now lushly green. And you see it not only when you're driving in and out of Savannah, but you see it from their entrance, looking across towards the lake and the lush greenery beyond. And you're being asked to take it away from these people and to rezone it to general commercial, not planned development commercial, in which the size of the store, uh, the shopping center, whatever it might be, could be constrained. Instead of having this, this huge, well more than a big box store, allowed on that parcel, it could be limited. And let me tell you, this developer, Mary Todd Holmes, came into staff in the pre-application conference, this is in the record, and asked for, I think it's, it's in, in my, what I sent you, I think it's around 35,000 square feet, relatively modest size shopping center, but I think something like 140 parking spaces around it, as a planned development commercial property. Now, somewhere along the line, the developer got a little more greedy and decided, well, you know, staff's being so cooperative on this, as staff unfortunately often is with the applicants, and so maybe I can get even more. So let me go in for general commercial. The problem with general commercial is you don't have a site plan. You don't know what's going to happen with this lake. There was discussion by the developer at the neighborhood workshop that uh, that, that, that lake could be moved or reduced or perhaps even eliminated. You don't know. You don't know what, what else is going to be done. You know, what it's going to look like facing State Road 64. You don't know about the immense amount of traffic that's going to be generated along these roads. And Mr. Vogler also tells you, he's very good at giving you partial facts, that when Lakewood Ranch and the developer agreed to eliminate the prohibition of commercial uses and the deed restriction on this parcel that it eliminated in that agreement, I've got it right here, um, it's a matter of public record, uh, any, any uses that we could be concerned about, the kind of things that we're objecting to, I think is what he said. Well, we're not objecting to any of these things that are now prohibited. An adult movie theater an adult bookstore selling pornographic materials, a tattoo parlor, a pawn shop, a nightclub, and, and, you know, there's 18 of these things, and that's not what we're talking about. We're concerned about a really intense commercial retail development, replacing this beautiful, lush, green, verdant landscape that we had every right to anticipate would be part of this development because it was put there in the plan as passive recreation open space. Now let's talk about this commercial note because this doesn't qualify, frankly, even for, for planned development commercial. And they ought to be sent back, if you believe in win-wins, to deny commercial general, make this developer come to us or try to get the Board of County Commissioners to deny it, recommend denial, make the developer come to us and well, let's have a discussion about planned development commercial. You know, how can this be constrained in a way that, uh, that may, may fit with the neighborhood. But, but frankly, it's stretched to even say it qualifies for that. 
you know, Mr. Virgil would have, have you believe the comprehensive plan says every intersection of arterials is a commercial node. Well, that's not true. The comprehensive plan does to say that. And this one is not. There's office spaces at, three, at two of the quadrants. There's agriculture at another one. Now, maybe someday if Schrader Manatee comes in and gets that rezoned to commercial, he might talk about this being eligible as a node. But they haven't. It's agriculture and one unit per five acre residential at one of those quadrants. And you look at the definition of, of nodes in the comprehensive plan and it says compact and well-defined. So even if this was part of the node, there would be a problem because office is not commercial. Agriculture is not commercial. And, and it has to be compact so you don't wiggle down. But, it, but he's separated by this agricultural use. And the planning staff shows you all around this property is planned development residential and agriculture. It's not part of the node, even if that was eligible to be called a commercial node. And, and then you have these traffic impacts. I mean, my gosh. You know, these people bought in there with the promise this is going to be, you know, forever passive recreation open space, lushly green aesthetically pleasing, not having an adverse traffic impact on their entrance. And now you're being asked to foist upon them, my clients, a commercial development that will generate PM peak hour traffic, I think it was 480 vehicle trips, in the, in the highest hour in the afternoon or evening. You know, throughout the day, many, many, many more. And this road around the rear of this parcel, this shopping center or big box store and, and the contract purchaser, you know, they're specialized. Look at their website in big box stores, targets and so forth. Um, good company, I'm sure they're great at what they do, but it doesn't fit with this neighborhood. So all this traffic or a big part of it would be coming around the short way through our entrance. People never bought into that. They were told otherwise when they bought their homes, that this would just inconceivable that this would occur. And again, the, the children, the, the, the families park up there, walk across the entrance to the school bus stop, and now they're going to have to deal with cars coming to and from this commercial development, zipping through. And the hazard that's created by residents driving through the intersection to get in and out of Savannah and having to deal with left turn and right turn commercial traffic. You know, it's a hazard asking to happen. It's dangerous. It, it is totally ill-advised. And again, if, if the applicant was coming in for, for planned development commercial, PDC, not CG, and because that's a planned development that takes into account the characteristics of the parcel and the surrounding land use. And, and don't be all that bothered by the fact that the homes are sitting back some distance. They do come in and out of their entrance. They do enjoy uh, the, the views from this parcel and the benign impacts of that parcel on, on their subdivision. So they're clearly affected persons. And, and my clients, the ones I'm speaking for, are some of the ones that live closest. They, they got this notice as an adjacent owner. Uh, for the hearing here today. Their concerns are not silly. And their well-grounded opposition is not silly. As to the 100-year floodplain, now, if you allow development in a 100-year floodplain, you're looking for flooding problems. Now, that's being all put off here because it's not PDC. There's no site plan. You don't have to deal with flooding problems at this stage. But you know there will be flooding problems. Staff prepared this graphic. As part of the re rezoning, this is part of their file for this rezoning here today. That red is in the 100-year floodplain. And I looked very carefully at, at the map that was put up there based on the letter from Stantec. And it looks to me like that everything they want to pay over, pave over, or most of it at least, is still in the 100-year floodplain. And I see a nod from your stormwater expert. So ask him if, if you think maybe I'm wrong. And so I think this was done after that letter, honestly. Um, 
So, you know, Manatee County has had a problem with developers being allowed to build in a way that creates flooding problems. Now, you don't have that if you deny. You don't have that if this remains the passive recreation open space that these people in this subdivision of Savannah bought into and were promised. Not just by the recorded instrument between Schrader Manatee and, um, and the developer, but uh, also by the very site plan that you're being asked to amend. I showed it to you. Passive recreation open space. No question about it. Now, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not against all development um, as, as an attorney or as a citizen. You know, development has done some good things for our community. But there's a premise that I, for one, embrace, and I certainly hope you, as the front line of defense of the public interest against imprudent development, would embrace, is that development should be controlled in a way that's consistent with the interest of impacted neighborhoods and the public. That the developers shouldn't just get anything they want by waltzing in and asking for it. And if there was ever a case, and I've been doing this kind of thing uh, in Manatee and Sarasota County and the cities uh, for decades, I have never seen anything that stinks as bad as this. You know, there, there is no entitlement. There is no rationale. Uh, there is no excuse for the irresponsibility and overreaching greed behind this proposal. And, and maybe that goes too far because, you know, I'm a, I'm a businessman myself. I get a law firm, and I believe in making a profit. And so everybody can try to do as much as they can to make the biggest profit they can. But they're not entitled to get it with adverse impacts like this on hundreds of people. And the precedent that this sets, you know, if, if you can have a developer with an incomplete development take a parcel that's designated for open space in the preliminary site plan and come in and have it amended and steal that away from the neighborhood and develop it the most intensive commercial development for this kind of retail development that's conceivable, you know, four times a big box, uh, almost, uh, three times, whatever it is, uh, you know, it, it's, you know, you're going to, this isn't the last one you're going to see if you approve this. And to say that this is good because it serves the shopping needs of neighborhoods in the area, that's a justification for extending commercial into residential areas throughout this county. So you're going to start seeing more and more of that. Uh, this, this is completely indefensible. It's certainly not, not silly. And as for the commercial node, you know, again, let me emphasize, not just a node. In a node, you look it up in the dictionary, and it's component parts gathered together, basically touching each other. And your comprehensive plan states clearly not only that does commercial have to be in a node, it has to be in a well-defined node of compact groupings. So again, you've got this. From your staff report, a parcel that's surrounded by non-commercial, residential only, or agriculture zoning. How on earth is that part of a commercial node? It's not. You know, the, the staff report talks about nearby land uses to this property. They're all residential subdivisions, except for one small medical office building quite some distance away up at the other side of that intersection. And they talk about the commercial on Lorraine Road. Uh, interested to hear, uh, Commissioner, about the, the shopping center. But that's quite some distance. You can't say this is part of that node. Um, and right now, I got on Google Earth, and all it is is, is self-storage facilities and, and a barber shop, for what I can see. This is clearly a residential area, a PDR, planned development residential area, planned to protect the interests of the residents there. That's why it's PDR. And, you know, if, if this developer wanted... 
Meritage Homes wanted to develop this as commercial. They had that opportunity in 2014 when they drew up this site plan. And they could have designated this quadrant as commercial. Then people would have known what to expect, but they didn't. They designated this as, as, as passive recreational open space. That's what these people have. That's what's allowed to be built on this property. There is no entitlement to take it away from them. There is no right. There is no reason that serves any interests other than that of the applicant. Again, the, the 0.35 maximum FAR, because you count in this lake as long as it, it's there. We don't know what's going to happen if this is approved. To that lake, but they get they get to build a commercial building up to seventy nine thousand three hundred and seven hundred and thirty seven square feet in size. A big box, it's fifty thousand. Substantially more than a big box. The staff report notes that if they qualify as this being in an activity node, and staff has been so liberal and you know excessively liberal in saying that this is a commercial node wouldn't be a stretch, I would think, to maybe find that it's an activity node at some point. And that gives them 113,909 square feet of commercial development on this parcel next to this lake, as long as it happens to be there. Does that make sense? You know, or, or send this developer back to its offices and thank the contract purchaser for you know, their efforts to get as much as possible and tell them no. You know, this should remain PDR, Plan Development Residential. If the developer wants to come in, build a few homes there, maybe amending the site plan to allow that might be contemplated, but not general commercial. If the developer wants to work with the neighborhood to try to limit this access of all this dangerous traffic through the subdivision entrance that, that in, in the subdivision road, that my clients pay for, then we can have that discussion and limit the size of the commercial, make an attractive streetscape or landscape along the front to try to maintain some of this natural verdant landscape that these people were promised and bought into. Do it right, but not this. This road behind what would be a shopping center is now paved. Google Earth shows it as a dirt road, but I, I subsequently saw photographs that, that I pr presented to you, put into the record of showing how hey, it's brand new blacktop. And I thought there was a little brick sidewalk between it and the subdivision road, but I find that that was another entrance to the subdivision road. It, it connects seamlessly to my client's entrance road. And so traffic is going to come in that short distance to this property if it's developed as a shopping center. And they are even planning, I understand, to widen that road at some point to 84 feet. And, uh, you know, if that's just connecting our subdivision back on to the road further distance, passing by this lovely uh, open space that uh, that they were given when they bought into their subdivision promised as part of the approved site plan from 2014 to date, then that's fine. Maybe it would be a nice, lovely drive, but not what is being proposed without any entitlement whatsoever. So again, it comes down to this. It's a choice between the developer and the developer's interest, Meritage Homes, the contract purchaser, and those interests are evident, or a choice to side with the interests of the hundreds of homeowners in Savannah at Lakewood Ranch who stand to have over five acres, which they have rightfully expected to remain as their greenscape passive recreation open space, in which they drive past daily to and from their homes, and as they are in their entranceway, enjoy and have for years looking across as part of that open space. Having those five acres ripped away 
from their subdivision and turned into a potentially unappealing commercial development, creating traffic problems and flooding risks that they will avoid and this county will avoid if this scheme is denied. What's right here, what's legal here under your comprehensive plan is evident and it's not silly. This cries out to be denied, hopefully by unanimous vote, not just those of you that traditionally in past applications have been a little more sensitive to neighborhood concerns, but even those of you that are very, very strongly in support generally of applications for development. Because all of you, each and every one of you, should appreciate that when development occurs, it should be done right. It should be done consistent and compatible with the neighborhood interests and the public interests which are affected. And you clearly have a choice. No legal entitlement, no right for this property to be taken away from the site plan, turned into commercial general, rezoned from planned development residential. It, it, it's inconceivable that that argument could be made as a matter of law. And we have set forth legal reasons why it must be denied. But again, right is right, wrong is wrong. The, the difference here is as crystal clear as I've ever seen. And hopefully it strikes you the same way. Please recommend denial. Thank you very much. And if there are questions, Mr. Vogler urged that you ask me questions. So I, I really would invite that. Any questions for Mr. Lobeck? I have a couple. Mr. Ron. Good afternoon, Mr. Lobeck. Yes, thank you. Um, earlier, the gentleman earlier stated that Prairie View Drive is a private road that belongs to the HOA. Is that correct? I, honest, I honestly have not researched that. Where we get that from, where I get that from, is all the documents that the, that the staff has in their file shows that as private right-of-way. Okay, that's the phrase that staff uses in their maps. Okay. And then secondly of all, is the current, the, the site in question, gentleman also stated that's part of the HOA. Is that, is that, is that a correct statement too? Well, if it's private right-of-way, it has to be private to somebody. Yeah. And because Manatee County requires that uh, uh, facilities, private roads, stormwater ponds, lakes and so forth, uh, be maintained by an HOA, uh, I would certainly be surprised if that road is maintained by one of the homeowners or the developer in perpetuity or, or Manatee County if, if it, in fact, is a private road. Um, you know, maybe Mr. Vogler has something else to tell us about that, but that's the presumption moving forward unless it's clearly demonstrated otherwise. All right, thank you. Mr. Smock. Yeah, it was mentioned by um, the other gentleman that um, the property was supposed to be in perpetu perpetuity to the HOA as green space, that it was in, in the HOA language. Do you have that in, in, writ in writing from any of your homeowners saying that when they bought the property that this green space was always going to be available to them? Well, I think you had one of one of the homeowners testify that no, they, they testified that, that they were that they were testifying given. and have, having the, the actual in writing um, goes a long way uh, in, in pro proving proving points. So I, I'm, I yeah, well, you know, I mean, when people buy homes in a subdivision, sales agents will say various things. Um, they will say but, various things. But what counts, okay, is, as a matter of law, is what they're entitled to go to in the public record. Right. And anybody that were to, were to have researched the public record would have found two things. They would have found this covenant by Lakewood Ranch prohibiting commercial on this on this property, number one, and at our record notice to the world as a matter of law. And number two, they would have pulled they could have pulled up this and maybe some did, this site plan, preliminary site plan. I don't know why it's still called that when it's final. Uh, the PSP, um, the final approved site plan in 2014, and seen that. Okay, passive recreational open space. So, you know, if, if, the, if there's any promise, it's what's in the public record. And the promise in the public record was clear. They were to expect this as part of their subdivision to be passive recreation, open space, to be enjoyed by them forever and not turned into a traffic-heavy, uh, unappealing um, commercial development, commercial general, not even planned development commercial. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Roth. 
I'd like to put a, I'd like to put a point on this. Is there a recorded deed restriction that refers to the five acres being what in fact is going to be recreational area? Yes or no? There was. Is this on? It was up until March of 2020, and then apparently Meritage Homes approached Schrader Manatee, and this uh, amended deed restriction was put in saying, yeah, you, you can build a commercial on that property now, just don't put in a porn shop uh, or these 17 other things. <coughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, that was a record. Uh, and, you know, I, frankly, I think maybe there's a legal issue about whether that deed restriction was created uh, in part uh, for reliance upon third parties, and, and that's come to mind as to whether that's litigatable. Um, but from the standpoint of the county, you're being asked to change something that would destroy reasonable reliance uh, by by the homeowners, if that's responsive. Are you shaking your hand? No, it, it doesn't good. respond. So either there is or there isn't a deed restriction. It's plain English. Okay, the deed restriction. I mean, apart from the Schrader Manatee, the Lakewood Ranch deed restriction, there is a declaration of covenants, and I have reviewed that. And... Uh, you know, the developer doesn't have anything in there saying that uh, it takes unanimous consent of all the homeowners to change that plan. And in fact, there's all kinds of stuff in there. Disclaimers, the developer can take away property, do anything it wants to. So I'm, I'm not relying on, on the recorded declaration of covenants and restrictions for the subdivision. What we're relying upon is the site plan that you're being asked to amend more than anything else. Is that responsive, sir? Not enough, but I'll listen to it. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Rutledge. Who has title to this property? Where's the title lie in this property? I assume it's presently Meritage Homes, as is phase four um, uh, of, uh, of the subdivision. Uh, I, actually, I don't know. That's a very good question, something I probably should have researched before <laughs> coming to the hearing today. I, uh, I, Mr. Vogler, I'm sure, will tell you. I, I think the question I have that that leads to, Mr. Chair, and I perhaps am asking council this, are the representatives that are making this submission entitled to make this submission? Okay. Because if they have a contract for it, from who? And if it was actually owned or in the ownership under some other entity the Homeowners Association has right to, I'm just curious uh, how we end up here. I think that would be most appropriate for the applicant to explain yeah. the and relationship. Well, yeah. Council is, and Mr. And, Chairman, I'm sure staff has on file the affidavit of ownership mm -hmm. and the agency authorization form. Staff checks that ahead of time. Right. So. We'll let them respond, staff okay. or the applicant. And, and, and let me say this, too. I, 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 I do a lot of general HOA representation, have for, for four decades. And routinely what happens is that when the subdivision is built out, then the developer has an obligation to convey title to the common areas, to the so, open space. So, so I, I haven't looked at the declaration on that point, but uh, it, it would not surprise me that that's not the common, normal, accepted procedure that's intended to be followed. And the reason I ask that, this goes to the next question. This, you stated that, that this is a road that they developed and paid for. So my question is, there is this transition from ownership as a developer into an HOA where they turn it over. And so those improvements, again, accrue to the benefit of the title holder. And so I'm trying to just understand the process by which you end up there with these representations, which I'm not, I'm just curious who has that, who has ownership of the road, who paid for the road, who maintained the road, and those costs associated with this, because I just, I just want to follow the train of conduct that gets us here, because I don't think I understand, honestly. Well, I tell you, if, if this comes back, if this gets denied and, and the developer wants to work with us to make this planned development commercial, we'd certainly be interested in entering into a cost-sharing covenant running with the land for, for that segment of road. Um, as to who maintains it now, frankly, it's, it's a subsidiary issue. Um, it's a significant one, you know, and, and my clients have raised it. And uh, I'm concerned about it. But, you know, I didn't work it into my initial presentation or even the one today because there's so many compelling reasons to deny this other yeah. All right. Um, Ms. Mr. Um, Lobeck, you acknowledge that the covenants, deeds, and restrictions aren't something that would prohibit the use, the proposed use of um, this uh, application on, on this land. Is that correct? 
The, the Lakewood Ranch Covenant? No, the Community Covenants, Deeds, and Restrictions. Um, I, I can't testify one way or the other in terms of whether they uh, would allow this to be developed commercial. There's nothing in there that talks about this being okay. developed commercial. I can certainly tell you I, that. I'm not asking if it authorizes. I'm asking if it prohibits it. Is that your, was that your testimony? You, you, made, you made a statement. I'm trying to get no, clarification I, I, on your I'm, statement. I'm not. I'm saying I didn't look for that. Okay. I am saying that the developer did include in the Declaration of Covenants very broad entitlements to the developer to change things that are in the Declaration. So right. that's why we're not relying on the Declaration of Covenants and Restrictions here today we're relying on the site plan that these people bought under that you're being asked to change in a way that is clearly adverse to their legitimate interests and which site plan is that the preliminary site plan you stated the, the or, PSP right right exactly the preliminary site plan not well, the final it's the, site it's the plan. final site you know Manatee County calls it the preliminary site yeah. plan even after it's final uh, I've never understood that uh, for decades but um, but yeah, it's the it's the one that was approved in 2014, and under which this development has been proceeding ever since. All right. That, okay. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to be clear. The Planning Commission reviews the criteria for rezonings in Section 342.3 Land Development Code. We don't care about these private agreements. Yeah. We don't care. That's if Mr. Lobeck has a cause of action to sue Meredith Holmes for violating any covenant, that's up to him. He's mm -hmm. well versed in how to do that. Yeah. We're only looking at the comp plan LDC. You're getting in the weeds here with who owns what and who's we don't care. We're often we, in the we weeds. We don't get into that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I tend to agree with that. That's that's why we're talking about county stuff here now. Yeah. Not the All right, very good. Anything, anything else, further? Mr. Vogler encouraged you to grill me. I, I really enjoy this. Uh, anything else? <laughs> no. All right. Thank you very much. Right. Appreciate thank you. It. So just for a point of information, Miss, yes, Mr. What our attorney has just said is we don't care whether there was a recorded deed that indicated that this was going to be. Uh, I, I think uh, what her point was is private agreements are not subject to the purview of the Planning Commission, which is, you know, we, we acknowledge that. But I, I think there are some questions that are nuanced and they kind of lead to some of the information. So. I think uh, the the most uh, uh, important one that, that I haven't heard a clear answer to is the ownership. It, you think that would be something that would be very clear in the process? So um, we're going to we, just go. Could we ask? Yes, we're going to we're going to do that. So I, <laughs> I have a couple questions for the, for the applicant. I think would probably be the most appropriate um, folks to answer the question. So. Um, Mr. Vogler, can you clearly state who owns the subject parcel? And then in addition to that, please clarify the ownership on uh, Prairie View, the right of way for Prairie View. Sure, I'll be happy to. I'm Ed Vogler. I have been sworn. Um, and I, I want you to know I want to answer all these questions. But bef um, as part of that, I want to tell you that I've studied this extensively. These comments were made by Mr. Lobeck and presented to you. And he came here today and said he doesn't really know. And he's presented a bunch of hyperbole. Now, here's the facts. Five acres is owned by Meritage. They're the master developer of the Savannah Project. They have contracted to sell it to Casto, whom you have heard speak. SMR, when they sold the master tract, said there will be no, the only residential uses. That restriction ran only to SMR. It did not run to an HOA. It did not run to Meritage. It's benefited only by SMR. SMR then released the restriction that they put in place eight years ago and said in a letter that SMR wrote to you that's in the record, we support this. We support the Casto project on this five acres. Okay, so SMR had that right. They were the only one who held that right. Now I'm going to go a little deeper in the weeds. I'm sorry, it's very important. SMR has a deed, their standard deed. If you look at all their deeds across all their properties, they retain restrictions for easements and uses and all kinds of other things. That's how you do a master plan community. Clearly so. But here's the important point. There is an additional restriction in this deed. 
And this particular restriction I'm referring to now says to Meritage and to everybody that you cannot build improvements between the west edge of the property and Mill Creek. West edge of the development and Mill Creek. Well, why did they put that there? They wanted to protect the environmental resources of Mill Creek. But here's the interesting point. Pay very close attention. In that instrument, that restriction, no improvements between the property and Mill Creek, runs specifically by its terms to any HOA created on Savannah property. So you have one part of the restriction that SMR says broadly applies to everybody, and you have the other restriction, no, nothing but residential, applies only to SMR's rights, only. And that's, that's what they released, because it was their right. And so you've heard a lot of others. I, that's the answer to your question, Mr. Chairman. I've, I've got rebuttal, so I'll just stop. Mm -hmm. I can go on if you wanted me to. Uh, no, I think that answers that, that question. Um, I think I did have another question for uh, the applicant. Um, there was a reference to an executive order that allows for the extension of, for lack of a better description, development orders or uh, approvals. Um, it's, is, um, in, it's my understanding that those have to be requested. Are those typically, do you know if those are, are requested or if they're granted by right? No, I, th I thought that was just an obfuscation, okay? There is a statute that allows when there's an emergency for an applicant, a developer, to apply for and to pay a $425 fee to Manatee County mm -hmm. to extend a development order, mm -hmm. to extend a site plan. Right. That did not, that exists as a process, but you have to ask, ask for it. Mm -hmm. That did not occur, occur here. And the, the other companion point, Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind, and I, and I know of your background, and, and there is a distinction between a preliminary plan and a final plan, as we know. Um, the final site plan for this property says nothing about open space or recreation or anything. It simply shows the engineering for the lake. And, of course, they've all expired. So Mr. Lobeck says, well, I mean, if they're expired, how can you build homes? It's called the next set of the processes, called platting. Uh -huh. You know, you record a plat, and you can build your home whenever you want. And so the next 100 homes, if it's 100, I don't know that, but um, they're properly subject to being completed according to the recorded plat. Thank you. And uh, I might have missed it. Um, there's a lot of information coming at us, but um, did you make a statement regarding the ownership of... Um, Prairie View. Oh, yeah, that's that's very interesting because practically everything you've heard so far on that point is wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay, almost everything. And no respect to the gentleman. And I want to cover this silly comment for just a second. What I said was somebody claiming this is not a commercial node is silly. I also said that we respect all of these comments from the neighbors. I've also done this for a long time. And there, there, are, there are public hearings for a purpose. And I respect the gentleman completely. However, he's wrong. If these roads are constructed in the entire subdivision under a non-exclusive easement granted by Platt to the Lakewood Ranch Stewardship District. The Lakewood Ranch Stewardship District funded the construction and funds the maintenance. So when someone says, I don't want my HOA fees to go up because there's a commercial use on, the, on my private roads, that's not accurate. It's just not. I've got them all right here. And, and I think I, if you'll indulge, I, and I'll, we're, we're going to make our, we're not going to repeat anything on our, our rebuttal, but if I could just talk for a minute about, there were questions about the HOA documents and so forth. 
And of course, these are very, very important considerations. So let me give you a few more facts that Mr. Lobeck was unaware of. This five acre property is not platted. It is not part of the subdivision, all right? And so the quote was, they steal it from the subdivision. And he wrote it in his, in his papers that this is part of the subdivision. So if you go carefully, there are three Savannah Platts that have been recorded, three. And they dedicate the road easement to the, to the Lakewood Ranch uh, Stewardship District, and they don't plat the five acres. And then here is the ultimate, penultimate proof. In every subdivision under Manatee County rule, you have to list the holdings, a list of holdings that will ultimately be conveyed to the HOA. List of holdings. So you would expect, if what Mr. Lobeck and the kind gentleman said were true, that you would take out the list of holdings and you would see where it showed five acres, open space, being conveyed to HOA. But no. I have the list of holdings right here. These are, these are not platted. They're not part of the subdivision. They're not part of the commitment that was made by the developer to the homeowners. They're not part of the chain of title. It's just wrong. And when people come before you with hyperbole and emotional pleas and so forth, I respect it. I res totally respect it. When Mr. Lobeck does it, he needs to do his homework. And those are the answers. And uh, again, uh, not, not trying to address things that you're going to cover in your um, rebuttal, but uh, you made a comment that these roads were constructed and maintained by the stewardship district. So does that mean these are public roads, public rights of way? They're, they're absolutely public roads. So even though absolutely. they're behind the gate, some of them are behind the gate, it, it, are they also public roads? I, I don't know where the delineation is. And let, let, me, let me give you the, my framework for answering. I'm going to answer mm -hmm. I formed 35 community development districts. We have validated over a billion dollars in bonds to fund public infrastructure improvements. We have communicated with Manatee County for years on when you can have gates and what the protocol is for a gate in a community development district or stewardship district. And the answer is specifically, every one of those roads funded with public bonds is a public road. Not a Manatee County road public, not community generally, but the community generally is allowed to use every CDD road and every stewardship road. And by the way, some developers don't like that and they make private roads, all right? But this is what we tell the developer. When you want to come in and fund the road with public funds, bonds, public bonds that are validated by the court and closed, and Mrs. Jones comes driving up to the gate. I'm sorry, this is, I got it a little bit reversed. Some bad person comes driving up to the gate and says, I am here to steal Mrs. Jones TV. You have to let them in. You have to let them in. Now, you can stop them. You can take a video. You can have a camera that gets the license plate because CDDs also have security powers. But, Mr. Chairman, the direct answer, and if I've equivocated or explained too long, public, boom. And so Meritage, Casto, everybody in the public has a right to drive on those roads, and that's how it is. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for Mr. Vogler? I do have some questions for staff. So uh, I, I had one other question. Uh, the detail of the um, RMS uh, Liquid Ranch Trust that holds these exclusive rights, these prohibitions for the 19, uh, we, we call them typically noxious uses. They have been released by Liquid Ranch. Is that correct? No, that's not correct, I, and, and I, I think I need to clarify that. Lakewood Ranch starts with a proposition 
that there will be only residential uses on their lands that they control until they release that residential only restriction. So once they release the restriction and they say, oh, you can have commercial, then they list 18 things you can't do. Okay, so those 18 things are still there, right? No head shop, no adult video, you know, some things that at least Lakewood Ranch finds is offensive. Now, we, we don't get into talking about these things because, as your counsel mentioned, and I sort of intimated she would in, in my primary presentation, these private restrictions are not the bailiwick of our land use hearings. But they came up in the, in the 25 pages that Mr. Lobeck presented, and we felt we needed to respond to them. Okay. Mr. Relich, does that answer your question? Yeah, very okay. Thanks. All right, anything further for Mr. Vogler? Before we go to some questions for staff. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bogler. Um, for staff, uh, Mr. Gerstenberger, um, I, you know, I, I have uh, experience with regard to this, but I, I think it bears discussing just to make sure, um, as a group, we understand. Um, the existence of floodplain on a property doesn't preclude it from being developed does it? When I say floodplain, every every project is designated, every property is designated with a floodplain designation, but what we're talking about is something less than a 100-year designation. Mm -hmm. In this case, I believe there was an AE designation with two identified stages. Is that correct? <clears throat> Mr. Chair, that is correct. Um, there is no prohibition from development within a 100-year floodplain. However, pursuant to sections 801 and 802 of the Land Development Code, and subsequently in the Stormwater Engineering Design Manual for Manatee County, um, any development within a 100-year floodplain uh, typically has to provide floodplain uh, mitigation uh, for impacts or fill within a 100-year floodplain that typically can um, be construed as either uh, cup for cup uh, volume compensation for equivalent uh, fill or for utilization of a drainage model to demonstrate uh, that no adverse impacts are created. So it, the the fact that there's a uh, established floodplain elevation ponding on the property, for lack of a better description, doesn't prohibit it. You, you're saying that you have to mitigate in the form of compensatory storage, either through modeling or cup for cup. Is that... Mr. Chair, that is correct. So if, if this application were to be approved and the, the maximum allowable uh, floor area ratio were to be attempted and as a result, the floodplain could not be, the compensation for the floodplain could not be uh, demonstrated, what would, what would the uh, applicant have to do? <clears throat> Through the uh, administrative uh, permitting process, which would be subsequent to a rezone application, um, the engineer of record through a final site plan and or a construction plan um, submittal would need to demonstrate that they could um, equivalently compensate for the 100-year floodplain impacts, mm -hmm. or they would have to reduce the scope of the development within the 100-year floodplain, at which point they could, uh, e at the very minimum, um, create equivalent floodplain compensation volume for the floodplain uh, volume impacts associated with the development. So in a, in a roundabout way, that's an additional constraint on how much development you can do on a property. Mr. Chair, that is correct. And in addition to uh, floodplain mitigation, the, the uh, project, as far as the stormwater design, would also have to include water quality treatment and attenuation of post-development runoff. Very good. Thank you. Um, and then the other question I had was regarding the preliminary site plan. That there was a representation, I think, of a preliminary site plan, as I noted, that was provided in a uh, pre-application meeting. Um, th the what's the binding nature of a preliminary site plan? I don't know if that's best for Miss Rainey or Miss uh, Lidar. Is is a preliminary preliminary site plan considered a binding site plan? Uh, 
the preliminary site plan is subject to change if the applicant approach and have a different uh, um, mm -hmm. proposal? And is this the process that mm -hmm. they have to propose change the use or remove some areas or and he's analyzed and is part of the public hearing process. Is it unusual for things to change between the preliminary site plan and the final site plan? It's common procedure, you know, like uh, you have an area that is not suitable for residential or for commercial mm -hmm. or to convert some areas that were proposed at recreational and right now you would like to change it for the location of lots or move the amenities. And it's when it's PDR or PD, you have to come back in front of planning commission and board or only the board, depending on the nature of the change. Mm -hmm. so, or if it's a final site plan only, it depends of if according to the land development code sanction, I think it's 3.3, I have to find it here, mm -hmm. that what we can approve administratively or have to go back and to the board depend of the change okay all right and then uh, the i think the last question i had was regarding the change in use i think at one point it was represented this was open space um but regarding the existing community the the approval for the existing community that does the changing this use, does it cause a violation in the minimum open space for the Savannah residential? No, the minimum community? open space is 25%, 25 and uh, the applicant is half before close to 51%, and right now with this reduction is 50%, mm -hmm. and it's still more or less the double of what is required of planned development. Okay, thank you. Question? Mr. Roth. We're going to um, add lanes to State Route 64. Would it be possible that it would, this could be taken by FDOT to widen the highway? Anybody? We don't know. I work for Manatee County, sir. <laughs> so we don't know. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we said that. Oh, question? Sure. I mean, Ed Vogler. I, I, I will not re repeat myself on the uh, uh, rebuttal. Um, SR SR 64 was a subject of an extensive corridor study that was done by FDOT, and this intersection of uh, White Eagle Boulevard was extensively studied because there's a roundabout right there. That's where it was built. And so we've had meetings with um, FDOT, and there's no indication whatsoever. They have plenty of right-of-way. And so we will have to get a permit from them because likely we'll have a right-in, right-out uh, on our property. And we'll have to get a connection permit from FDOT to State Road 64. Very good. Mr. Rutledge. Just one other question, Mr. Uh, Vogler, if you don't mind. In your statement that you will probably, and I know this is not required for you to determine, but if it were true that you could get a right in, right out, would that diminish the traffic on the secondary road that the concern has been raised about? Um, yes, of course it would. And the only, I didn't mean to use probably in some type of waffly way. We, we, we want, we'll sure. apply for, we'll seek, we'll expect to have a right in, right out um, we meet all the spacing criteria. We'll probably have to have some type of turn lane, deceleration lane, and so forth. But in terms of the way developers conceive projects, we want access uh, to State Road 64 at that place. In, in, in keeping with that as well, the adjacent property to the west, have you had any discussions with them in regards to uh, common access if you were to get one and they have what they have? I mean, has that discussion occurred? Um, so... There are private discussions like that, and as I told you, SMR owns that land, and they're supporting our application. I don't think – this I did not study, but I'm pretty confident that they will not be able to have their own connection. More likely than not, they'll have to have it off of uh, Prairie uh, or, and Eagle. And Eagle. Trace. But, I mean, if our client bought it, then it would be continued. So, you know. My, my, my thinking is just a question of – 
uh, velocities. Uh, but if you had access off 64 and then had a through access off Eagle and Prairie, it, just, it, it seems to me that there might be some uh, diminishing of traffic through the main entrance uh, into tra this is the only way to get into the, the commercial piece, correct? I mean, is that reasonable? Yeah, yeah, I, th I think that's the practical reality. Uh, but when you're here, you know, at this stage, you, you can't you can't talk about that per se. But but I do I do want to make one more point on the on the on the connection the connectivity uh, point. You know, the reason Lakewood Ranch has been successful is they retain a lot of control and power, and so it shouldn't surprise you that they have control and power over these questions as well. And so when when the Lakewood Ranch developer which is our neighbor, writes you a letter supporting your project, that's not like an insignificant scenario. I mean, that's a, you know, move the mountain type question. And so I guess, uh, you know, we've moved the mountain on that one. Very good. Any other questions? All right. If, if not, I'm going to shut down the dialogue and we're going to go to closing comments. So. All right, hearing nothing further, uh, staff closing comments? Um, I was just gonna try to address some of the issues that some of the speakers brought up. Um, Please. There one um, about the, and there was a question about, oh, I'm sorry, Dorothy Rainey for staff and I've been sworn. And um, there was questioning of the maximum square footage that could be developed on the site. Yes, ma'am. Um, the wording was, a maximum of 150,000 square feet or a 0.35 floor area ratio, whichever is less. So it's the 79,736 that they're going to be allowed to do. And of course, that can even be further limited by uh, required improvements that they have to place on the site to accommodate the development. Um, also, let's see, um, we did look up on the, the plat of that area and the um, Prairie View Court was labeled as a private platted right-of-way, just for the, for the record. That's what we found out. Tom was nice enough to look it up. <laughs> um, and um, I guess, I don't know if it needs to be said, but if the uh, preliminary site plan was originally approved with that um, area shown as open space, the board has the ability to um, reverse that and to approve another alternative, in this case, removing it from the project. So that's what will be um, approved um, through the, the board's consideration, of course. Um, there were a few other, I guess, concerns about the traffic and conflicts with the, the school bus stop and all that. I don't know if um, Nelson has anything he can, I mean, they're, they're gonna be required to do the traffic, you know, detailed traffic study when they come through, forward with a final site plan, which should address a lot of those concerns, I would think. So um, but that, I think that's all I had. Yeah, yeah that, that's it for me. Thank you. Okay. Any, Mr. any Mr. Gerstenberger? Um, just to, um, in addition to what uh, Dorothy just brought up about Prairie View Drive, uh, the subdivision plat for Savannah at Lakewood Ranch, phase three, subphases 3A, 3B, and 3D and a replat of a portion of track 400 Savannah at Lakewood Ranch phase one. Plat book 64, page one would be the cover sheet. Um, references Prairie View Drive as track 302, private roadway, drainage and utility easement and public utility easement on sheets five and six up to subdivision plat. And then back on the cover sheet, on the cover page of the subdivision plat, under the section for a certificate of ownership and dedication, subsection number 2B um, uh, refers to a non-exclusive ingress and egress easement across tracks 302 and then additional track numbers for the express purpose of installation maintenance, repair, and replacement of property and facilities of the district, which the district is referring to Lakewood Ranch Stewardship District. Does it have a dedication? Is it dedicated to That the... is under the ded dedication okay. section on the cover sheet, correct. Very good, thank you. All right. 
Anything further from staff? Okay, very good. All right, um, we're gonna go to the ap applicant closing comments and then Mr. Lobeck, you'll have three minutes for factual corrections. Thank you, my name is Ed Vogler. I have been sworn to represent the applicant and I'm going to ask uh, Katie Labar to come and help with this. Um, and we've crossed out a lot of subject matters that we've covered. And, and I, I will not repeat the transportation comments or the floodplain comments or the planning comments other than um, to appreciate what Ms. Leiter said. Because if you accept, if you accept Mr. Lobeck's premise, you can never amend your preliminary site plan even six years later. And as Ms. Leiter points out, this is routinely done. Not, not only amending it, but amending it between PSP and FSP. It happens. And it's an evaluation made by staff as to whether it's material or not, whether we have to come back here. But six years later, you have to come back here, but that site plan was expired by its own terms in February of 2019, as I represented to you and confirmed by the FSP approval letter, uh, which exists in, in this matter. I'm gonna ask Katie to comment about the bus stop and the comment that there is no commercial in any of the entrances to communities in Lakewood Ranch, because each of those comments are incorrect. As it relates to the size of the buildings that can be placed here, you've heard the phrase, I counted it nine times, maybe it was more, big box. Well, let me, let me explain, you know, there's not gonna be a target on a five acre parcel. I think that's fair to say. But let's talk about how the code works, right? You, you have a floor area ratio limitation. And as staff just mentioned, it's 0.35, right? Which is 113,000 maximum, right? 113,789 or whatever it is, something like that. Okay, so that's the maximum allowable, but then, you have to meet every other code provision, parking, internal access, uh, dumpster, fire, loading zone, right? Landscape buffer. You have to meet every other criteria. And the estimate for a commercial development is between about 7,500 and 8,000 square feet per acre that you can actually build which puts this at about 35,000 square feet, right, on five acres. Now what Mr. Lobeck told you is the applicant went to the DRC staff or pre-app meeting or sometime early in the process and sat down with a plan that showed about 35,000 square feet and 140 parking spaces, I believe that's what he said. And so then the staff and the applicant discussed what is the proper process for bringing this forward to you and to the board? And I think it might have been buried a little bit in what Katie said, but it's very important. She said that she, the staff encouraged this, and we agreed. Because let me explain to you, maybe Mr. Lobeck did not participate in it, but what we did in this community is we amended our land development code. And we said, basically, I don't know how any of you voted, but it came through this board, we're going to emphasize what's known as Euclidean zoning. Not every piece of property needs to be a planned development that comes here for a five acre parcel. We have, as part of that process, substantially beefed up the land development code as it relates to buffers and setbacks and other criteria. Your staff has no discretion about that. If you want to get an accommodation from the rigorous requirements of the Land Development Code, you need to present a planned development project and come here and ask for it. But if you are completely consistent with all the rigorous codes and ordinances, why do you have to go through plan development? That's what we said as a community. That's not Casto saying that today. That's what we said as a community when we adopted amendments 
to the, to the land development code. So please reflect on that. And that, you know, all of us in the land use world, we're, we're subject to the state statutes when the legislature is in session, they adopt a rule and it's applied to us, right? When, when the county commission amends the land development code, developers may grumble about it, but we have to comply. When we ask your staff for variances, they can't give them. So this is the proper process, and we're here explaining it to you today and asking for your support. And I haven't heard one thing, although Mr. Lobeck, I, I'm going to put him on play repeat because he says it's always the most egregious com project he's ever seen in his life. I mean, you know, run it back through and play the tape again. There are always legitimate points to be made at, at public hearing, and that's why we're here. And you all have got more experience than any of us. You've sat here and watched it. The easy ones and the hard ones. This one is easy because we respect the staff. And it's not very often you get a staff report that says, we see no issues, right? We see no issues. We support this. So I don't know why the discussion is to throw the staff under the bus, right? You don't know what you're doing. The staff report is wrong. You're reading commercial nodes wrong. By the way, when did the definition of commercial node depend upon the land uses that are around it? Everybody says, why don't you plan for roads? Why, why, why? Well, then when we plan for the roads and we put them in place and we build them and we build a roundabout in conjunction with the, with the FDOT, then Mr. Lobeck comes forward and says, well, you know, that's not really a commercial node because that property is still zoned agricultural. I say this again. That is a silly argument. And for those of you who have sat here through all of these hearings and all of these amendments to codes and, and understanding of planned development projects and how we go about putting these things together, I think you know that as well. And I mean no disrespect to the gentleman or to the community, none. But to say this is not a commercial note planned for by Manatee County and FDOT is not, not good land use thought, put it that way. All right. All right, I'd like to ask Katie to complete our presentation, and I want to thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate our staff. We work hard with them. We have an expectation when we have a good staff report that we'll get an approval. And uh, we recognize the emotional issues that are presented, but there isn't anything to suggest that this shouldn't be approved. Good afternoon, Commissioners, uh, fellow uh, Chairman. I am, again, Katie LaVar with Stantec, representing Meritage and Casto, and I have been sworn. Two, two key points that I want to touch on, the first of which is regarding comments made about the bus stop. Uh, as many of you know, I'm also a mother of two young children, and as moms, we are always very concerned about our kids getting to and from school safely. As we've evaluated this application, and I believe you have, yes, perfect, you have the um, the slide on the screen, um, you do again see that the entrance to Savannah and the school bus stop is indicated on that exhibit. Um, these are you know, a significant distance away from the proposed commercial development. Um, from an influence standpoint, uh, as a professional planner, I don't see that there's a significant impact to the school bus stop. That is definitely something that will be evaluated as staff has st stated at the time of final site plan and when a traffic study is prepared and presented and evaluated by staff. Um, if that is an issue that needs to be addressed, it's something that we will work through um, at time of final site plan um, and in coordination with the community, If again, if necessary and if required. 
Um, I'd like to now transition to another presentation where I have some uh, exhibits that illustrate commercial development adjacent to neighborhoods. I think many of these, um, many of these uh, areas are going to be quite familiar to, um, to several of you and to the, to the viewing public. Uh, the first of which is Lorraine Road and University Parkway. Um, as you can see, a uh, public shopping center uh, is in, is, has been developed and it is in, in close proximity to emerging residential development to the east, west, and north. Uh, the second, am I not, I'm not making it through the glass, I don't think. I'm not, I'm not able to transition, can you? Perfect, thank you. Second uh, intersection that I want to illustrate to you is, uh, again, Lorraine Road and State Road 70. The, all four quadrants are um, being developed, have been or will be developed commercially. Uh, I want to particularly point, you know, draw your attention to the southern quadrant, um, both quadrants uh, north, uh, east and west side of the road. And again, the proximity of those uh, commercial uh, uses near and adjacent to the neighborhoods. They do abut, um, and again, they use features, environmental features, as well as stormwater facilities to provide that separation and distance uh, to ensure compatibility. Oh, and again, and another important point is the two examples that I have shown are indeed in Lakewood Ranch. It was asserted during testimony that um, this doesn't happen in Lakewood Ranch. Um, it, it does. That's part of, uh, that's part of master plan communities. The next example is along State Road 70. Um, this, uh, this is at the entrance to Rosedale. At the entrance to Rosedale, um, you have commercial centers on either side of, of the entrance. And um, again, close proximity to neighborhoods. Uh, the boulevard entrance to the neighborhood provides direct access to the commercial center. There's no alternative for access other than the main entrance to the neighborhood to the, to get to the commercial. So um, it it does happen in the community. It, it functions well in the community, um, and uh, it's it's an asset to the community and to the neighborhoods that surround. And then finally, uh, this is really an uh, one of the oldest uh, site that we've identified of all of them. But this is um, at at Braden Run and State Road 70. Again. Uh, right up against uh, the Braden Run community. And we really, we, so we've identified this one as one that we wanted to, to bring to you because it, it the, the commercial that is adjacent to the neighborhood um, connects directly, again, directly to the neighborhood. And um, the uses transition appropriately from more intensive commercial and retail uses to office uses. And um, it, it, again, it functions beautifully uh, it's it's well utilized by the community, and it's just another example of good good design um, that can occur when these uses are co-located. Um, that's all that we have for you today. We appreciate your attention. We appreciate the um, positive staff reports uh, that were presented by your staff. Uh, we request your recommendation for approval, and we're available to answer any questions that you may have. Very good, thank you. And then, uh, Mr. Lobeck, I presume you have some corrections of fact? And you want to state the time limit? Three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On issues of fact, and facts matter. You know, it's a debating technique to say my opponent said this when your opponent didn't say that, and so some of these fit into that. And, and he's saying, you know, Mr. Vogler says, you know, we're saying that we need to look at the land uses surrounding the node. No, I'm talking about the land uses within which is alleged to be the node, and they're not commercial. And... Uh, and this property is separated, even from those office developments, as a matter of fact, by agricultural land. So how can it be part of a commercial node when there's agricultural land in the way? It, you know, so I didn't say what he said, and 
what I did say is very compelling. About the size of the building, there is nothing in the record, nothing in the record, that would demonstrate that the full 79,736 square foot building uh, cannot be built. And a target, big box target, can be as, as the size of 50,000 square feet. And staff said it could even go up to 113,909 as a 0.5 FAR if they make a case that they're activity known. So ac allegations are being made that are not in the record and you're therefore not entitled to matter of law to rely upon them. As far as the plat being in existence, is all we have to do is plat phase four. You have to plat phase four under the PSP. If the PSP isn't there, this developer can't build phase four. It relies on a PSP, so this has to be a viable development order or the developer wouldn't be doing what it's doing. And most of the point, you wouldn't be here being asked to amend the PSP if it no longer exists. Um, with regard to uh, the bus stop, it'd be a little late, wouldn't it, at final site plan stage to say that, oh, yeah, we got a bus stop problem. And when this has already been approved for commercial development, there are entitlements in place, there are roads that they're entitled to use. Um, what do you do then? That's not the time to fix this problem. The time to fix this problem is to deny what's being requested that they're not entitled to receive and which it makes no sense to receive. So I'm tempted to, to stretch what is a uh, rebuttal on issues of fact, but you know, those are material matters to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing and uh, open it up for discussion, deliberation, uh, thoughts on this, these two applications. Any, anybody have any uh, pertinent thoughts? I think it's worth noting that Dan Lobeck like, left the microphone with seconds on the clock still. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the, uh, I understand the concerns. What I'm observing with this application is something that we see rather frequently, that the, um, the, uh, the unknown is causing a lot of consternation or concern on the part. Um, we, uh, we, we see it rather frequently. What's, you know, I'm sure there are uses there that would be embraced by the community. I'm, I'm sure there's uses that um, might not be welcomed. But um, again, I've stated it before, one, we have a very narrow uh, um, responsibility, and that's to, to compare this to the comprehensive plan requirements and the land development code requirements and, and uh, use those two documents to determine the validity of the application. But um, any additional thoughts? If not, the chair will consider a motion. And uh, remember, we'll need two motions with uh, number five, I think, probably being the first. Correct. Just, Mr. So. Chair. Mr. Smock. It, no, Mr. Delezine, sorry. <laughs> I may recommend adoption of Manti County Zoning Ordinance number PDR 14, PR amending the relating PDR 1409, ZP, and approve the revised preliminary site plan with previously approved stipulations A1 through A4, B1 through B3, C1 through C4, D1 through D8, and previously granted specific approval in sections 402.7.D.5, 4013.D.8, 703.I.7, and 701.3.D as recommended by staff. All right, we have a motion by Mr. DeLesline. Uh, do we have a second? Second. Mr. Ross, second. Any discussion? All right, the chair's going to call the matter to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign? Nay. Nay. Or aye. Mr. Smock. Smock. All right. Uh, chair votes aye. Motion passes five to one. And uh, as is traditional, Mr. Smock, when uh, there's a dissenting vote, we just like to get for, on the record what the uh, major points of concerns would be. Again, the, big, the biggest, biggest point of concern is access. Um, if, if they were, I, I know it's putting the, the car before the horse and getting those DOT approvals for 64 access 
Uh, that's to me is an actual game changer for the actual property use. So very good. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, follow up. So um, we're up to item number six. Um, so uh, again, the chair will entertain a motion. Mr. Chair. Yes. I, re I move to recommend adoption of Manatee County Zoning Ordinance Z2006 as recommended by staff. Very good. We have a uh, motion. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Ross, second. Um, any discussion? All right. The chair is going to call the matter to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign? Aye. Uh, Same reason. <laughs> very good. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, chair votes aye. Motion passes five to one with Mr. Smock noting the same reason. So, okay, very good, thank you. That uh, concludes that application. I'd like to ask, do we need a break or? I need okay, let's go ahead and take a, uh, a 10 minute break. Thank you.
What? Very good. Luckily, this is the uh, last application. My phone can't take many more of these. So. All right. All right. Uh, the next application we have is item number seven. Uh, Ms. Leiter, can you read item number seven into the record? Yes. Item number seven, C2007, BH Venture, LLC Rison, BH Venture, LLC Owner, PLN 2004-0011. Rison from Professional Median PRM to the Neighborhood Commercial Median MCM Sunning District, located 200 feet north of Cortez Road on the west side of 75th Street West and commonly known as 4312 75th Street West Bradenton. The total acres is 0 0.35. The case manager is Jake Bibler. This is a quasi-judicial case and Mr. Smith is the applicant. Sorry, Mr. Smith. <laughs> Good afternoon again, Commissioner. I'm yeah, sorry. Uh, for the record, have there been any ex parte communications regarding this application? No. 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 Seeing none, Mr. Smith. Thank you for the pronunciation of my my name, Mr. Connolly. Um, and no, I always say this, but if she called me anything else, I'd be disappointed. Um, this is an application as, uh, oh, by the way, Bob Schmidt, for the record, and I have been sworn. Uh, and I do not see my clients back there. I, I told them that we were running a little bit late, and I don't think that they're going to be here. So in any event, um, I'll try not to take as much time as the last application, and, and we'll move forward. Uh, <laughs> um, this is an application for a straight rezone from PRM to NCM at 4312 75th Street West in West Bradenton, very close to the intersection of 75th Street West and Cortez Road. This is owned by BH Ventures, and the B BH stands for uh, Braxton and Holway. They are a CPA accountant firm, accounting firm, been here in, in Bradenton for a long time. Uh, and they are uh, in retirement mode and want to sell the building. Um, this is a 2,800 square foot building that's been there since 2005. And um, they have had some interest from retail users, small retail users. It's not a very big building. It doesn't have a lot of parking. And they realize that their, um, their, their, their uses are limited, but they have had some interest from uh, people that do want to sell things. And they cannot do that with PRM zoning, and therefore they're asking for NCM in this case. Uh, I put two maps up on the um, camera there for you. And the first one is from the staff report. It's the zoning map that shows you that it's currently zoned. It's, you see the outline of the parcel. Currently zoned PRM. It's got neighborhood commercial to the south. And uh, it's across the street from the shopping center with the Bowling Fish and uh, other retail users in there that you're probably all familiar with. Um, so it's uh, it's it's a it's a logical candidate for neighborhood commercial zoning. It's uh, the staff report says 200 feet or thereabouts. It's I think it's a little less than that from the intersection of Cortez and 75th. Therefore, it complies with commercial locational criteria. And it, it is obviously in the uh, Southwest TIF and urban service area, so it's a logical rezone to uh, convert this for additional uses. Uh, and I just want to say for the record, too, that the, um, if somebody does come along and wants to continue to use a building for office purposes, they can do that in NCM. So it doesn't hurt them. They're not losing the ability for offices. And I just wanted to, to point that out. Uh, worked with Jake on this. Uh, read the staff report. Concur with the findings. Appreciate all his hard work and uh, find it consistent with the comp plan and the code. And uh, we ask for your approval. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Very good. Any uh, questions for Mr. Schmidt? So is this near a commercial node? <laughs> yes, it is. It's, it's, it's very close, yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Makes me feel better. All right. Anything? Is that a Walgreens on the corner? That's all CBS. Oh, CBS, thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I ask one question? Mr. Sure. Rutledge. Is there, is there any uh, uh, title easement access points between the parcels on either side, or is it exclusively uh, accessible through that one entrance? Mr. Rutledge, the answer to your question is it, it has its own driveway, and it does not have cross access in either direction. Okay. And, and I, I put the aerial up there so you could see that. 
That building to the south uh, used to be a CVS when it was built, and then it got converted to like a patio furniture store or something. Right. I'm not sure what it is now, but there was there was no cross access there. Pink flamingo at the time. Mm -hmm. It's a pink building. Is that what it's called? All right. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll go to staff staff presentation. Good afternoon. I was thinking good morning, but it's late. Um, so, the next day. Jake Bibler for staff, and I have been sworn. Uh, this is BH Ventures, uh, as Mr. Schmidt uh, mentioned. Z2007. I'll try to be as brief as I can on my PowerPoint here. Uh, general site location, as mentioned, is at 75th Street West, uh, just north of Cortez Road. The request is uh, to rezone 0 0.35 acres from professional medium to neighborhood commercial medium. Uh, you can see the future land use categories. It resides in the Res 16 future land use category with the coastal planning area and this uh, Sarasota Airport height overlay district. Uh, you can see the nearby future land use categories on the map uh, and their outline there on the side. The current zoning, as mentioned, is prof professional medium. Uh, the adjacent site to the south is neighborhood commercial medium. The site to the north is professional medium. Um, to the west, we have residential duplex district, uh, six units per acre. And across the street to the east, across 75th Street, is general commercial. To the south is planned development mixed use. Uh, just a, a brief look at some of the, the surrounding uses. Um, as Mr. Schmidt mentioned, uh, across the streets, across 75th, is uh, the shops of Paradise Bay with Bonefish Grill. There's Winn-Dixie, Starbucks. Uh, to the south, as uh, previously noted, there's the Pink Pineapple, which is a um, uh, furniture sales. It, it was uh, it actually, initially, uh, established as an Eckerd drugstore, so then converted to CVS. So, um, the site design details: minimum setbacks are 25 feet to the front, uh, 15 feet to the rear, and 10 to the sides. Uh, site constraints: 0 0.35 FAR uh, would be 5,320. This is actually inside an activity node, uh, uh, so commercial node does allow 1.0 FAR. Uh, which would be 15,000 square feet, but site constraints would, would likely not allow that. Maximum three stories and the required open space is 15%. The existing site, uh, as mentioned, the existing development is a 2,808 square foot building. Um, the setbacks are approximate. The site plan does not show the existing, um, so these are approximate uh, 90 feet from the front, 20 feet from the rear, and 10 from each side, and uh, I believe it's a two-story building there. Just a quick, few quick photos. This is looking head on to the site directly across the street, uh, from directly across the street, uh, the pink pineapple to the south. From the driveway of the subject site, looking to the northeast uh, along 75th and across at uh, Bonefish Grill. And this is the site that's to the north of our subject site that does have some professional uses. Positive aspects, the subject site has frontage on 75th Street, a classified arterial roadway. Uh, it's located in, in an activity node. Neighborhood commercial medium is consistent with the comprehensive plan uh, because of the locational criteria, and it's consistent with the adjacent and nearby commercial zoning districts. Our negative aspects, the proposed zoning district uh, does increase the allowable commercial uses over the professional medium, uh, which may introduce some potential uh, additional light and noise impacts to the adjacent residential land uses. Mitigating measures are LDC provides standards for specific uses that may have negative externalities um, and requirements for additional landscaping and buffering for certain commercial uses next to residential uh, uses will apply. 
We do find it to be uh, consistent with the comprehensive plan and our lane development code and staff recommends approval. I'm available for any questions. Very good, thank you. Any questions for staff? Okay. All right, we're gonna go ahead and open it up for public comment. Is there anybody in the audience who wishes to come forward? Is there Anyone any at all? <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah, we'll wait and see if anybody comes running in. Must be happy no. hour. Uh, seeing no one come forward, we're gonna close the public comment portion of the hearing and uh, open it up for questions or staff closing comments. All right, staff closing comments? Okay. Uh, applicant rebuttal? Sure. <laughs> I think he's left. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, there seems to be uh, very clear information with regard to this application and no need to discuss. So um, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing and open it up for discussion or Mr. Chair, a motion. A motion. Mr. Ron. Based upon staff report, evidence presented. Comments made at the public hearing and finding the request to be consistent with the Mantee County Comprehensive Plan, the Mantee County Land Development Code. I would recommend adoption of Mantee County Zo Zoning Ordinance number Z2007 as recommended by staff. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Sorry, uh, who was that? I think, I think I'll, I'll <laughs> Mr. We'll give it to Mr. Roth. He's, uh, he was awake. That's yeah. what I do. So we have a motion by Mr. Uh, Ron and a second by Mr. Roth. Any discussion? All right, the chair's going to call the matter to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Chair votes aye. Motion passes 6 0. Thank you. That concludes our hearing uh, today. Uh, just please note we have a workshop next uh, next uh, planning commission. So, and it'll be after the hearing, correct? Mm -hmm. So, stormwater. Yes. Yay. You can get your CEUs. Uh, yeah. You can get your CEUs. <laughs> you said that I'm just saying you so you didn't have to do. So, uh, one last time, we're going to go ahead and close the meeting. So. <laughs> so excited.